Number 10, Queen Victoria's passing. Some say it ended the Victorian era, but it actually kind of extended a little while past that. She was the longest reigning queen at the time and a symbol of Great Britain's power. She also wasn't the nicest. Uh, she oversaw the conquering of India, which pretty bad. The special flower wars in China, which saw China give five of its major cities to the British Empire, <laughs> including Hong Kong, which kind of an awkward one there too. So yeah, her passing was sad for most, but for others, especially foreign nations, it was a reminder that the brutal overseers are still there and they're probably still gonna rule for another like 70 years. Oof. Number nine, World War One. This is considered to be the end of the Victorian era and it makes sense, especially the first half of the war. It was a mixture of old world versus new world. Horses and cavalry swords versus Germans in trenches with large rapid fire blam blams. In Great Britain and of course other European nations, they were foaming at the mouth to attack each other. However, culturally speaking, they were the same since Victoria had passed. Not much had changed. However, after her passing, and of course after the war, big changes, huge changes. So much so that it changed the world and in different ways in different countries. We need a whole list to go over that, but empires fell, America got rich, and they went back fighting shortly 20 years later. It was kind of awkward. Number eight, stiff photographs. For some strange reason, people in the Victoria era were like the grandfathers of all goth kids. Any obsession people have today with the strange and unnatural, well, you can partially thank the Victorians. A good example of their obsession with the weird and oddities is post-mortem photographs. Yikes, yes. Given that photographs were a new and amazing technology, and for the time, yeah, they were, and that people had some less than living relatives lying about, well, it only made sense to capture their memory forever by having their picture taken. Dressed up, prepared, and positioned in many different ways just to bring the mantle by the fireplace together as what would a home be without the post-mortem photographs of your old Aunt Burge? Am I right or am I right? It's weird, I don't know. Number seven, grave robbing. If ladies of the evening and cold-blooded de-lifing have always been a part of life, then so it was grave robbing. The second someone was buried with anything valuable, there's been a creepier person on standby with a shovel. That's just how it goes. Poor Dompe from Zelda. Guy gets a bad rap. This was no different in Victorian times. However, while digging up corpses for baubles and trinkets was certainly done, there was a far more lucrative business, especially for those in the mad scientist business. <laughs> Sorry. People were paid under the coroner's table to dig up cadavers and retrieve them for doctors and medical professionals to conduct all sorts of freaky deaky stuff. Mostly just to learn, but you can be sure someone got a little weird with it. We always do, we always take it too far. Number six, Christmas fire. One of the things my mama always taught me was fire safety. My dad taught me how to deal with a bonfire after 10 beer, but well, mom's lesson was safer. Never leave the stove unattended. Put candles out when you're done and know your fire escape plan. You gotta know it, you never know. While this event may seem like a wholesome family fun on the holidays, I get anxiety just thinking about it. In Victorian times, families would play a game at Christmas called Snapdragon. You get a large dish or bowl or cauldron, I guess, large enough for everyone to gather around the table and fill it with a whole bottle of brandy. Then pour in some dates and large raisins. Then ignite said brandy ablaze and try to grab the blue flaming dates without getting burned. Folks, this is a time before modern firefighting techniques, burn medicine, and houses are just really close together. So one good fire could take down a whole block, maybe a city. Not a good idea, don't do this, don't recommend. Look, Mom, I got the flaming raisin, and now the curtains are on fire, wow! Number five, the potato famine. Potatoes have been a staple of many cultures' cuisines for centuries, partially because of their ruggedness, easy to grow attitude, and not only filling, but very delicious. Ooh, let me some fries. Good box of hot fries and some salt, baby. Let's go. Well, 1845 Ireland was a wee bit different as a fungus outbreak was taking hold of the mighty potato harvest all over the country, thus creating a large famine that would see one million people or more perish in a large famine. Queen Victoria tried to help but was extremely ineffective and by help, well, I mean the same effort I put into reading books assigned to me in high school. Sorry, Miss Middleton, I used Cliff Notes. I'm sorry, I did. I used, I'm sorry, I love you, Miss Middleton, you're the best. But I read like 10 pages out of the book, so that's gotta count for something, right? Right? Number four, the Napoleonic Wars. Like World War I, this time can be stretched to include Victorian England. 
Why is this event so dark? Well, because Napoleon wasn't going to stop. France had recently discovered what freedom was, and sacre bleu, it tastes amazing. <laughs> and they overthrew their government. Napoleon surprised everyone by being an amazing general. Dude took on multiple nations at once and won multiple times. It's extremely impressive. However, in a classic case of went to his head, he became the leader of France and declared himself the first consul of France, or emperor in other terms, and started stripping away rights, especially from women, which sucks, like a construction worker who kicks off his boots at 5 p.m. I know you're out there, you guys just, you just kick them off. Just get rid right of those boots, they're stinking. He invaded other European nations and was on a path to destruction until the international community put him to, put, put a stop to it. They said no more, dude. Number three, dirty. It's dirty, isn't it? Oh, it's dirty. It should be noted that the streets of Victorian London were not clean at all. Maybe the filthiest, maybe the filthiest ever. It was so bad that in 1858, the Great Stink occurred, which basically was all the refuse and filth piling up in the River Thames. Combined with a heat wave in the summer, the issue had literally been mounting for years and now would come to an offensive bubbling over. Oh, that must be awful. The smell was so bad it was making people sick, and people were most likely getting sick from the river from cholera outbreaks. God, that's disgusting. Cholera was more common than you'd like to think. It took some serious engineering and a lot of pumps to fix the sewage issue that was severely outdated. It wasn't fully fixed until 1875. Keep your soap and your hand sanitizing here, my folks. It's gonna be a little greasy. Number two, ladies of the evening. Oh yes, the streets of Victorian England were filthy, all right. And if every street corner was a lovely lass for lowering her dress in hopes of luring in a customer, as they say, oh yes, she shan't have to wait long, as this type of business was more common and profitable back then than you'd really like to think. Personally, I don't see why it is illegal or still is, especially if it becomes regulated. I mean, why not? Let, let them do what you gotta do. However, it was bad. There was a lot of sickness and bedroom related sicknesses. It wasn't good. It was horrible. I just fell off the box. Sorry, I'm an idiot. Number one, Jack the Ripper. Oh. Not much I can say about this guy, but the YouTube won't let me say, so here we go. The first serial unaliver to do what they do in the pale moonlight. The streets of Victoria and London were crowded, dirty, like I said, and oftentimes chaotic. So for a true psychopath like Jack to exist only makes sense. He was kind of a ghost. He was responsible for the passing of several women who worked the streets and, uh, well, they were really violent crimes. We can't show you, but we'll show you a picture of Jack in a cloak or something, maybe in the moonlight or something like that. The worst part is he was never caught, like ever. Not, they, we don't, we never got him. Or he was a she, or he was multiple people. We, we just don't know. There's many theories, but because of technology at the time and, and crime solving things, we just, we just didn't, we, we didn't get him. Number 10, mudlarks. Victorian London, around the 1840s, it was a bit of a mess. Yeah, a lot of sore throats, that's for sure. Everybody was sick all the time and the jobs that were available certainly did not help the cause. The jobs that were available had you catching rats and crawling into sewers. One of the worst jobs to have was that of a mudlark. As their name hints towards, a mudlark involved getting in deep in the muck that builds up alongside the Thames River. This one was reserved for younger folks, obviously, because it was like working in quicksand. If you're older, you would just get trapped. It was pretty sad. It was also exhausting, not to mention the chances of being washed away by the river were pretty high. All for the slim chance of finding a pocket watch, driftwood, rags, anything really worth your troubles. Number nine, chimney sweep. I remember when I was younger, I had to sweep the chimney in the house every now and then, whatever, and I personally, I loved it, you know? I thought I was the father of the house for a bit, getting in the chimney, getting all dirty and stuff, doing this, my hands on my, on my waist, I don't know, it's, that's, that's what a man was when I was younger. That little broom too, I love that little broom. I remember when I would do this, my grandmother, who is very English, she would be shook. She would watch the entire time. She would be taken back into time because this was a terrible job to have in Victorian London. I was, yeah, it was not the same at all. Chimney sweeps were famously young. I can't say anything else there in regards, but yeah, they were, we lads, to say the least. History is horrible. 1840 was a good year, all things considered, because a law was passed that then made it illegal for anyone under the age of 21 to climb in and then clean a chimney. Thank, thank God, I'm glad that stopped. I was 18 cleaning my chimney. I had no idea I could have used this great law. Been like, actually, mother, 
A lot of claws. Number eight, funeral mute. Funeral suck, man. I was a pallbearer like three times before the age of 21. My one arm is just strong as f now, that's it. I can lift anything just with one arm. I thought being a pallbearer had a lot of pressure, right? Victorian London saw many, many funeral mutes. Oliver Twist, one of those lousy jobs in that tale was that of a funeral mute. Funeral mutes were required to dress in all black with a sash while carrying a long cloth covered stick and your job would essentially be to stand and mourn silently at the door of the recently deceased home. Yeah, guy dies of a plague and you're like standing there like holding your breath like great, this is the worst job ever. You would then lead the coffin to the graveyard. So a lot of responsibility, yeah, don't trip or breathe. Number seven, toilet troubles. Now, the Victorian era was unsanitary, to say the least, but it was also dangerous in ways that you wouldn't expect, right? Go to the bathroom and you may not come out. One of the greatest Victorian inventions was that of the bathroom, but it took a few tries to figure out the whole, you know, methane gas problem. We gotta really deal with that one first and foremost. Spontaneous combustion of the bathroom was weirdly common. This would, uh, this is every time you take a shit, you were worried that you might just Woo, that was horrible, that's so scary. Flammable gases like methane and hydrogen sulfide, they would build up over time with human waste. Human, a, a, a lot of human waste. Built up in the sewers and then eventually would back up into your homes. Next thing you know, you're lighting a candle and your bathroom's gone. Just like that. Now we have poo-pourri. You know what that is? You ever see a little spray after you go, you just, you hide what you've done with one little spray at your friend's house. It's fascinating how far we've come. Number six, stairs. Yeah, believe it or not, stairs were a common danger in Victorian times. I'm somebody personally who falls up and down stairs a lot. I'm 6'2", I'm lanky as shit, I have like a Gumby body, I walk around like Woody, I'm always falling up and down stuff, it's horrible. Especially in Canada, it's so slippery, I'm always, always slipping all the time. In Victorian times, I would have been doomed. Houses were thrown up comedically fast, there wasn't a Mike Holmes on Holmes to come in and check it out, there wasn't a building inspector that made things, you know, safe. Servant staircases, they were tiny, they were out of sight, they were built into these narrow walls, often missing steps that they had to and cut corners just to, you know, be narrow and out of the way. That plus a tray of hot soup and a lot of clothing, yeah, it was next to impossible to move around without something happening. A lot of fatalities in staircases. Even today, around 12,000 people die each year falling downstairs. Hold on to that railing. I'm here to remind you to hold on to that railing. It's crazy. There's actually no stairs there. I just made that whole thing up. Hit that like button for magic. Number five. Burke and Hare. Medical schools were offering a handsome fee for deceased bodies to study. This was, this is an odd time. So an unhealthy amount of Victorians came up with this new solution. They thought they were brilliant. Yeah, they would rob graves. They would just go and rob the freshest graves they could find. They would wait in the bushes until the funeral's over and then they would go and Disgusting. It got so out of hand that family members were actually guarding the graves of recently deceased overnight. That's how bad it got. That's disgusting. But nobody goes down in history like William Burke and William Hare. They were an unlikely duo, to say the least. They wouldn't wait until the body was done living. You know what I mean? They would actually kill people and rush the process, all for a pretty penny. 16 victims in total between 1827 and 1828. It took 16 victims for people to start catching on to this weird plan. The pair would lose were victims into their house, fill them with alcohol, and then they would suffocate them. They had a sick system and they would suffocate them because the body needed to be in the best condition possible in order to receive a payout from the Edinburgh University Medical School. So they would, you know, try and keep it as clean as possible, which is horrible to say, but it makes sense. The Anatomy Act in 1832 put an end to this horrific plan. Number four, bird hats. Look, I don't have much to say about this next one here because, well, all right, yeah. I love a good hat. I've worn a few hats here throughout my time on Bumblebee, some baseball caps, some beanies here and there, sure. I've never worn a dead bird on my hat though, and I don't think that I will. That's for certain, I might just leave that out. Taxidermy was a hot topic back in Victorian London. Folks would rock the dead beaver bowler hat, any animal they would just prop up there, and it was considered fashion at the time, believe it or not. It was a dangerous trend though long term. Conservationists were saying that 67,000 species of birds were all at risk of extinction due to this crazy dead bird hat craze. Can you imagine just a stuffed seagull on my hat? I'm like, all right, number five, here we go. It's crazy. Also, that's like a lot of weight, you know what I mean? A lot of weight on your head, just kinda 
Oh, sorry, there's just a dead pigeon on my head, so my neck's kind of sore. What if the wings opened up and you kind of just like got some air? Maybe that's why they did it. Number three, holiday cards. Today, these Hallmark holiday cards, they go way too hard. And they also have a card for everyone and everything, you name it. Birthdays, weddings, stepdad's name day. You're like, what? That's so specific. Like they have everything covered. But back in the 1800s, these holiday cards, they were brand new. Nobody knew what to write or say. So they would just end up sending these artistic sentimental scenes. It would be like a frog in a top hat riding a bike. No caption, just that. You'd be like, hey, Merry Christmas, I guess. It'd be like a carrot with a face. It'd be a haunting image, really, to receive from a loved one on Christmas, but it's the thought that counts, I guess. This holiday season, just give your parents a card with this on it and then see what they do. Don't even write anything. Just stare at them in the corner, all Victorian-like, and be like, Mother, father, Merry Fortnite Christmas. I don't know what they would say. Number two, lots of arsenic. We of course have to mention a big problem in the 1800s. Arsenic, everywhere, all at once, okay? Skin lotion, tons of cosmetics, it was a nightmare. Even if you didn't use any facial cream or anything, it was everywhere else. It was in wallpaper, it was in dresses, it was in toys, medicine. My gosh, it really was horrible, it's a nightmare. And it's because arsenic was cheap at the time. It was during the Industrial Revolution. It was being unearthed more and more and finally, come 1851, the Arsenic Act was passed, which fixed a lot of issues. Yeah, we regulated that one. Not soon enough, but we definitely got that one fast. And finally, number one, Jack the Ripper. Unidentified to this day, we've got to end on a horrific note. Everybody's just finding out now about Jeffrey Dahmer, it seems. He's a hot topic on Netflix. But what about Jack the Ripper? How did he get away with it this entire time? Why aren't we going to see a Netflix doc on him? Ever. Jack the Ripper was active in the East London neighborhoods, primarily targeting sex workers in the area. Now, at the time, the murders of five women from August to November of 1888 were believed to have been connected somehow to Jack the Ripper, although some sources claim that he was active even until 1891. Again, we're never gonna know at this point. Many believe Jack the Ripper had some anatomical knowledge due to the way that he left his victims. I can't really say anything else because it's disgusting, but yeah, he knew some things, disgustingly. And while there were some suspects, including a member of the British royal family, believe it or not, Jack the Ripper was still never identified. Number 10, mummy unwrapping parties. This is, uh, yeah, pretty disgusting right off the hop. During the Victorian era, there was a fascination with ancient Egypt and the practice of mummification because they didn't have Netflix back then, so people gathered to do this. Mummy unwrapping parties were a popular social event where wealthy individuals, they would purchase, well, mummies, and then gather with their friends and family to unwrap them. Just slowly unwrapping a person. That's disgusting. These events were often held in the privacy of their own homes or museums and were viewed as a form of entertainment and education. Both, no, definitely not for both. Guests would gather around the unwrapped mummy to inspect and marvel at the preserved body. However, these events were controversial as they were viewed as disrespectful and unethical by many and if not all people around them. As these mummies were often obtained through questionable means. Yeah, how does that guy end up in London? You know, a pharaoh is now in London? That makes no sense. For sure not where he died. Definitely not where he died. The trend eventually came to an end as archaeologists began to push for more, you know, respectful treatments of ancient artifacts and real people and their remains. What kind of purge party is this? What are we doing here? Can we go home? Number nine, your skin can breathe. This, yeah, I don't know. We were all frogs. Little did I know. During this era, there was a widespread belief among scientists, like real scientists, that human skin could breathe. Similar to how lungs inhale and exhale air. Yeah, we could breathe through our skin. That's, that's a fun one. This theory was based on the idea that the skin has pores that allowed oxygen to be absorbed and carbon dioxide to then be expelled. As a result, some people would wear looser clothing and avoid tight corsets to allow their skin to well, breathe more easily. Literally, to allow you to breathe more easily. That's so gross. However, this belief was eventually debunked as it became clear that the skin does not actually function like a set of lungs. Ha! Huh, who knew? Not me, that's for sure. Nonetheless, the idea of skin breathing persisted in popular culture and language for many years after. You know, there were some believers that are like, no, our hands are breathing. We can breathe through our hands. Number eight, crotchless undergarments. While it may sound shocking, crotchless underwear was indeed a part of Victorian era fashion. It was most common for women, however, it wasn't intended to be scandalous in any way, shape, or form. Rather, it was a practical solution to the difficulties of wearing heavy petticoats and, well, corsets while still needing to use the restroom. You gotta undo a lot of stuff. At first, you're like, eh, this doesn't sound very good. Yeah, it makes quite practical, I guess, if you all have to wear nine duvets as a dress. It's pretty practical. So 
Though it may seem strange to modern sensibilities, crotchless underwear was a functional and necessary aspect of Victorian fashion. But it was also hiding a little secret. Number seven, hair. Hair everywhere. Yeah, legs, body. You couldn't see anything, so you didn't have to shave anything, right? That's it, problem solved. During the Victorian era, it was not common for women to shave their legs or their bodies at all. This hadn't been invented yet, I don't know. The concept of hair removal was considered inappropriate, actually, and it was considered to be associated with the lower class. Yeah, so keep it, keep it thick. Women's clothing at all time was designed to cover most and all of their bodies, which meant that their hair was usually not visible. Nice. Moreover, using razors or other hair removal methods was also considered too bold or even unhealthy back in this era. See these creams back in the Victorian era, they were quite unsanitary. It was one thing putting it on your face, but removing hair in tender other areas, that of course could lead to infections or other health problems. It wasn't until the 20th century that hair removal became more accepted and even popular especially with the rise of shorter hemlines and more revealing clothing. Yeah, we'll shave it up a little bit, sure, why not? Number six, lice everywhere. Lots of hair, therefore lots of lice. They go hand in hand, sadly. During the Victorian era, lice were a significant problem due to poor hygiene and living conditions. Lice infestations were common among both the rich and the poor, so there's no getting away from this one. Many people suffered from itching, rashes, and infections caused by these little nasty parasites. Families had to use various remedies such as vinegar and kerosene in any attempt just to try and kill these little suckers. Some people needed special combs to remove lice and their eggs, gonna throw up, from their hair. Now, despite efforts to control the eggs and the lice problem in their scalp, the problem persisted throughout the Victorian era. It was tough, right? It wasn't until the early 20th century with the, you know, improved hygiene practices and the development of insecticide that lice infestations became less common. Yeah, we, we missed that. We were almost buggy in our hair. Close. Number five, bleach mask. Madame Rowley's toilet mask. Where do I begin with this one? It's kind of fun, kind of terrifying to look at. At first, I thought this was a mask you had to wear to go to the bathroom, but no, that would have been a bit better, a bit cooler. Just a Jabberwocky mask for no reason. Compared to everything else on this list, I was like, sure, people would do that. Why not? A toilet mask was a natural beautifier for bleaching and preserving the skin. Even removing complexion imperfections. Yeah, all that happening under one Jason goalie mask. What a treat, what a miracle rather. You'd only have to wear it three times a week and then voila, you were beautiful. Turns out lead cosmetics pasted onto a mask and then onto your face three times a week, that was not beneficial for your health. Yeah, who knew, right? Ah, smelt so healthy. We didn't end up looking younger, we ended up poisoning our faces all in the name of beauty, but just wait, it gets worse. Number four. Toilet troubles. Ah, the bathroom, another dangerous reason why we can't use it. Victorian era was unsanitary, to say the least, but it was also dangerous in ways that you wouldn't expect. One of the greatest Victorian inventions was the bathroom, but it took a few tries to figure out the whole methane gas problem. Spontaneous combustion of the bathroom was weirdly common, and now I have a new fear. Flammable gases like methane and hydrogen sulfide, they would build up over time in and around human waste. Human waste would build up over sewers and eventually would back up into your home in that era. So next thing you knew, you're lighting a candle and well, your bathroom and your entire life is gone, just like that. And you didn't even get to go to the bathroom. That's it, it's the worst part. Number three, hot, dry summers. In the summer of 1858, London was hit by a severe heat wave, causing the Thames River to dry up and then release a strong odor of sewage and rotting matter and feces. Anything that's in that water is now just sitting out and about. So you can only imagine. The stench was so unbearable that it made people sick. It disrupted businesses in the area. It was a real problem. The problem was caused by a lack of sewage treatment facilities and of course raw sewage being dumped directly into the river. Well, that sure didn't help, did it? The stink drew public attention to the need for better sanitation and prompted the government to invest in the construction of a modern sewage system. It had to get really stinky before we solved it. This event marked a turning point in the history of public health in London and led to significant improvements in sanitation practices that helped to prevent the spread of disease. So again, had to get really bad before it got better. I say not great, but better. Number two, weird Christmas cards. Number two, weird Christmas cards. During the Victorian era, there wasn't much to give your loved one, right? You can't give them a Nintendo Switch Lite. You're like, hey, here's a picture of a frog doing a tango. That's all I got, that's it. The practice of exchanging Christmas cards became popular during this time. These cards would feature colorful illustrations of winter scenes, nativity scenes, other festive motives, you name it. Whatever they could tell stories of, they would draw it in really weird, wacky ways. The tradition began 
then in 1843 when Sir Henry Cole commissioned an artist to create a card for him to send to his friends and his family. Now the cards were expensive but were initially only affordable for those wealthy folk. But as printing technology improved, they became more widely available. So score, now you get to tell your loved ones how you actually feel with a wacky guy playing a tambourine. Victorian Christmas cards often featured sentimental messages and elaborate designs and they became an important part of the holiday season where we get it from today. All that pressure to write a little something something comes from that era. Today, vintage Victorian Christmas cards are highly collectible and are appreciated for their beautiful artwork. Beautiful, I guess, art is subjective. And its historical significance is rather amazing. I don't know, if you have one of these, don't throw them out. Don't make fun of them, just frame it and then sell it for a million dollars in like 10 years. There you go. And finally, number one, beauty patches. In the Victorian era, beauty patches were a popular trend among women of high society. There were these small black patches that were applied to the face as a way to accentuate certain features and draw attention to the wearer, the pale Victorian complexion. The patches were made of silk or velvet and were often cut into fun shapes like hearts, stars, or crescent moons, right? It's like the scene kids back then, they're like, mm. <laughs> They were typically worn on the cheek, forehead, or around the mouth. You can get creative, right? It's your face. Have at her. Beauty patches were also believed to have medicinal purposes, with some claiming they could cure headaches or improve one's complexion. Both absolutely false. No medical science around that. Despite their popularity, beauty patches were eventually, sadly, phased out of fashion by the early 20th century. But let's bring them back. I don't know. What do you all say? I'll wear a beauty patch every list from now on if we all want it. Why not? I'll do one right over here, a little crescent moon. I'll be moody, right? Number 10, rope makers. My arms are tired just thinking of this one already. Here we go. The Victorian era saw physically demanding work, especially, of course, in rope making factories. Today they have machines spin and get everything done in six seconds. Back then, you had to do it by hand. Their job involved the process of twisting these fibers again by hand, typically hemp or other materials, into these ropes using large manual machines. Now these workers would feed the fibers into the spinning machines which required quite a tremendous amount of strength and stamina to operate these things in the first place. Then the repetitive motion of twisting the fibers into ropes, and this took hours. This took tolls on their bodies, and of course, this often led to strained or pulled muscles. It's like a tug of war, but that's your job forever. That's a nightmare. The job required precision and skill to ensure the ropes were properly formed and durable, because you know, the town's construction sites were relying on these ropes to work. Nobody wants a lousy rope. I'm going rock climbing this weekend, and I'm gonna think of lousy rope when I'm at the top. Get all shaky. Number nine, asylum attendants. When the dancing plague happened, you know, back then, city officials didn't call in medical experts, but instead they called in a band to play music while these convulsing victims danced. So when we think of mental health and how it was treated back in Victorian times and history, it's eh, not so friendly, right? Not so comforting, that's for sure. Asylum assistants, okay, this was a job. They were responsible for managing individuals with mental illnesses, some of whom displayed violent or unpredictable behaviors. However, these attendants lacked proper support and training, which left them ill-equipped to handle such challenging circumstances. And in results, it was all it was all bad. The attendants faced physical and emotional dangers, enduring aggressive outbursts, attacks, and the lack of training arguably made these distressing and unpredictable situations way worse. Asylum attendants were like, eh, stop, what are you doing? It's like, that doesn't help. That's not how we do things. These attendants also worked long hours in overcrowded and understaffed facilities, making their job mentally and physically draining. The conditions they faced highlight the significant shortcomings and neglect in mental health care during the Victorian era. Yeah, they call them like mental asylums. You're like, can we change this up? Why is this so scary? Number eight, matchstick dippers. Just sounds dangerous, right off the hop. I don't know why I'm doing this. I don't know why matchsticks are this big all of a sudden. Matchstick dippers. Just sounds dangerous, right off the hop dipping a matchstick, what's gonna happen here? Matchstick dippers, these folks would often dip wooden sticks into a mixture of phosphorus and other chemicals to create matches. Someone's gotta do it, and back then they did it in a very dangerous way. Process of coating the sticks in the phosphorus mixture exposed workers to toxic fumes and harmful substances. Prolonged exposure to phosphorus led to a condition known as bossy jaw, which caused excruciating pain and disfigurement of the jawbone. Bossy jaw, they should make it sound less fun maybe, I don't know. Matchstick dippers predominantly young women suffered from serious health issues, including bone deterioration and necrosis. Furthermore, the work environment was loaded with fire hazards, of course, as phosphorus is highly flammable, science. The combination of toxic substances, long working hours, and the risk of factory fires every minute of every day made matchstick dipping a, various, made matchstick dipping a very dangerous, life-threatening occupation during this time. Even now, I'm like, I don't wanna be anywhere near any phosphorus. Thank you. Number seven, crossing sweepers. Back in the Victorian era, 
crossing sweepers were these individuals who earned a living by sweeping and clearing the streets for pedestrians to cross, right? Today we have the big scary thing with wheels, the big scary Decepticon looking truck that goes by and blows debris into your eyes, the spinning brushes. In the olden days, that was done by hand. Just one dude. Streets during this time were often dirty and filled with mud, horse, and other debris, just every, everything bad was on the streets. Crossing sweepers used brooms and brushes to create a clear path. Crossing sweepers used brooms and brushes to create a clear path, and in return, they would ask you for a small tip or payment from those who used their services. They're like, here, I cleared literal for you. How about a dollar? Thanks. They were especially common in urban areas where foot traffic was high, like downtown. Crossing sweepers were quite young. They were, you know, really young, if I can say that, if you get where I'm going there. And they relied on filthy streets as a mean to survive. So what a horrible, what a horrible scenario. Number six, human alarm clocks. Halfway through, we'll get a little fun, then we'll get back to the weird stuff. Human alarm clocks, also known as knocker-ups or knocker-uppers, which sounds a little different nowadays, so we'll go with human alarm clock. One of the weirdest jobs ever. I kind of wish this was still a thing. I don't know, I'd apply in a heartbeat. Knockers, knocker-ups, these guys, they single-handedly provided a unique wake-up service during the Victorian era for phone and clocks and all that helpful stuff. Before the widespread availability of alarm clocks, especially among the working class, everybody who had places to be, well, a knocker up has your back. He'd come and smack your window six times and then run off into the woods. What a great job. I kind of want this job. They would use long sticks or poles, whatever, just to tap your bedroom windows. Tap your windows and scare you awake. That often works. Shoot out of bed every morning. That's great. Think someone's breaking into your house. These individuals were typically paid a small fee for their services, which is wild considering what they're doing. Knocker-ups played a crucial role in the industrial areas with the rise of affordable alarm clocks. The need for these guys sadly disappeared. But you know what? Let's bring it back. Let's get rid of alarm clocks. They're all scary. Let's get these guys to come and tap on your window. Hey, you have work. Get up. You're like, thanks, sir. Please get out. Number five, hand stitchers. Yeah, this one's not as stinky, sure, when you think of these jobs, but it still sucked. With the rise of industrialization, many garments and household items were still hand sewn. Hand stitchers, again, often young women, they would sew clothing, linens, and other products using needles and thread. They worked in tight factories, overcrowded workshops, or sometimes in their own homes, often under poor conditions and for low wages, really low wages. The demand for hand stitched goods remained high as mass production techniques weren't widespread yet. It was close, but once sewing machines came into the picture, yeah, it eventually led to the decline of hand stitchers, which is good, right? I don't know, I'm torn because part of me is like, like, awesome, they don't have to do that by hand anymore. Then I'm like, ah, their only job was replaced by machines. So I'm like, eh, I don't know. I really don't have this one. Number four, bone grubbers. Again, sounds like it's gonna suck just from the name. A bone grubber? What does that do? Bone grubbers were these individuals who scavenged animal bones for various purposes. They liked all the bones. That's all I'll say. They loved any and all bones. You can figure it out. They collected bones from landfills, battlefields, and even graveyards. These bones were used for making fertilizer, bone meal, bone utensils. Fancy. I'm gonna grab my bone fork. Cheers. And even crafting tools. Bone grubbers worked in poor conditions and faced controversy for their activities because, you know, they would uh, steal bones from fresh graves, so more than fair, I'd say. As regulations on waste management in graveyards tightened, the practice of bone grubbing declined and hopefully disappeared forever because, uh, yeah, stop. Yeah, thanks. Stop stealing my aunt's femur. Get out of here. Number three, chimney sweeps. These ones were horrible. Uh, this one really sucked. I'll say what I can here without breaking YouTube guidelines, but yeah, these lads here, these chimney sweeps, they were younger gentlemen. As homes and factories heavily relied on coal for heating and manufacturing, chimneys became clogged with debris more and more every day. It's looking yucky up there. Now, instead of an old man who's broken, they would send in these Again, young lads, quite young lads, all I'll say. The shorter the better, right? Get them up there. Chimney sweeps would climb up narrow and dark chimneys using brushes and scrapers to remove all this horrible buildup. It was really not a fun time. Yeah, that's really all I can say about it. The work was dangerous, it exposed them to toxic fumes, and the risk of getting stuck or falling, well, that surely didn't help. Eventually, thanks to public outcry and legislation, this job disappeared in the late 19th century. Although I remember cleaning my chimney when I was younger. I'm gonna call my dad after this list. Number two, a tosher. Being afraid of rats 
cats and the dark, well, this is quite impressive to look back on. Atasher was a person who ventured into the dark and filthy underground sewer system in search of valuable items. Anything, really. I mean, we're down here. Anything good. Anything that's not soft, we'll take it. Toshers would navigate the labyrinth tunnels armed with a long pole with a hook in hopes to retrieve anything of worth. Coins, discarded jewelry, again, pretty much any other valuable objects that may have been accidentally dropped or washed away. Now they have it. Now they often faced harsh, well, rather disgusting conditions. Like, uh, for example, tons of human that's definitely down there for sure. Toxic gases, disease-ridden water, tons of rats, more human sh and given the era, there was a risk of collapsing tunnels all around you. So really the worst job you could think of in the Victorian era. Toshers relied on this hazardous occupation as a means of survival. It was all they got. Whatever you lost was all they had to live off. So what a terrible era, horrible job. And finally, number one, during the Victorian era, grave robbers emerged, just all of them out of nowhere. They're like, ah, oh, yes, with their shovels due to the high demand in medical research, okay? You give someone a body, they give you some money. That's all they had back then. No paperwork, in and out, boom. With a limited legal supply, these individuals resorted to stealing freshly buried corpses, targeting the graves of the poor and marginalized. Yeah, history is so scary, so disgusting. Armed with shovels, again, just coming out of the bushes with their shovels in hand, with their uh, weird, I don't know, who does this? They operated at night, of course, employing various techniques to avoid detection. Obviously, they did this like they were Batman. They didn't want to get caught because that's a little illegal. The stolen bodies were then sold to medical schools and private lectures. Public outrage led to the Autonomy Act of 1832. Thank God this was passed. This is a really fun one here. This legalized the donation of unclaimed bodies to medical institutions and reduced the need for grave robbery and established a regulated source of supplies. Instead of dudes just finding random people buried in random places and then bringing them in. That's, I'm glad we got rid of that. That's good. I thought dissecting a frog in science, I thought that was weird, but where those frogs come from, you know what I mean? Kicking off the list at number 10, a lot of hair. To kick off this wild part two, I had to include the tale of the woman who ate her own hair. Why did she do it? What happened? How much hair? Well, let's find out. All the questions about to be answered. The Liverpool Daily Post back in 1869 got the attention of those passerbyers with this one. A 30 year old passed away in the village of Lincolnshire. That's not too far off from the average life expectancy of the 1800s. But this case, this case was a little odd. Something was off about it. So doctors asked the family if they could carry out a postmortem. And lo and behold, a two pound solid chunk of hair was sitting in her stomach. It caused ulcerations of the stomach and ultimately caused her death. What a horrible way to go out. The woman's sister didn't know that over the last dozen years or so, she had been casually eating her own hair. Just one piece every now and then. Ultimately, it added up. If you know anybody that's eating their own hair, pass this on, send them this video. This sounds rather uncomfortable. Number nine, cat attack. If I have to pick, I would say I'm 100% a dog guy. Cats are cool, don't get me wrong, but this next story freaks me out a bit. Also, I had a cat once and I pulled its tail on it. <laughs> pissed at me and scratched me and scared the life out of me. So dog, dogs for sure. Back in 1870, a rich woman had put her time, energy, and resources into cat breeding. What a fun little hobby and lifestyle. She had tons of cats. She loved them all equally and they loved her. I'm allergic also, so this story is my nightmare on a level. But it does sound like a cute time. I'll admit, that's a nice way. Especially like in the Victorian era. What a, what a lovely little pocket of fun. 1800s, a lot of candles, everything being extremely flammable. Disaster hit often in Victorian times. And in 1870, a fire broke out of this young woman's home and the cats were sadly trapped in the house. They made it out alive, but by the time they made it out, the two maids that had kicked the door open to rescue them, they had gone full primal. The cats just attacked them and it was all bad. The fire in the house had obviously scared them, so when the doors were open, these two maids were both attacked by them at full force, essentially, all of these cats. Like, what a horrible thank you for saving all of their lives, you know what I mean? Number eight, quick divorce. Let's just say the love thing isn't working out, okay? It happens, people change, but now what? Say it's the Victorian era, but divorce in England isn't allowed until 1857, and it's 1856. So now what are we gonna do? Well, considering what list we're on and which part it is, it's pretty wildly unfair. If you were the wife, you were getting sold in this scenario. How horrible is that? Wife sellers, they were a thing. That was a legitimate business, how horrible. Yeah, you were getting sold if you were the wife. How horrible is that? Wife sellers was a legitimate business. There were auctions, public auctions would be done. You would watch people bid on marrying your wife. At like noon, middle of the day, people are walking by like, oh, do I have any change? Hang on. This is insane. One real sale that happened in 1862 was in Selby. The asking price was a beer. The asking price for 
this person's wife was one pint. Sold, just like that, that's crazy. Sold, drank, now I'm married. That's insane. Other times, most of the time, it was a rather expensive exchange. I feel like there are plenty of cases where this would honestly be the ideal scenario. Just get it done in one day, whatever, peace. See you again, bye, you're the worst. Number seven, the Great Famine. We're gonna lean out a wife selling for a hot minute and include the boys for this one. Yeah, come on back in, you're all guilty. The Great Famine took out everybody, not just Victorian women, of course. Back in 1845, potato crop that a lot of the Irish population was relying on was no longer available all of a sudden. A group of microorganisms just wiped them out, just like that, and in result, around one million folks died or had to leave. It was draconian law and British ruling that made the exported food hard to reach people that really needed it. So this famine led to Irish independence and anti-union movements. A little fun bit of history I had to include on this one. Number six, the Brooklyn Theater Stampede. And we're back to absolute horribleness. Here we go. I love the theater. When the pandemic shut down plays, I actually felt pretty sad. I like sitting in full rooms watching a guy in a fake wig monologue about Mozart. Like that's my ideal Saturday night. That's the best. I don't want that to not be a thing anymore. I love theater. But today we have an obnoxious amount of distractions that can take you out of the experience. Guy's texting, fighting his ex-girlfriend two rows ahead of me. I'm trying to watch Joseph and the amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. I'm like, man, it's not the same anymore. Theater's not the same anymore. Turn off your phone, throw a tomato at him. It can be distracting. Exit signs can also be pretty distracting, but we need them. We definitely need them. Because in 1876, the Brooklyn Theater caught fire after a single lantern fell over on stage during a performance. This was 1876. Everybody was wearing flammable attire. There aren't emergency exits yet. A fire marshal hadn't come in and counted heads at this point, so it was a disaster. 278 people lost their lives. A monument was put up after the incident. It shook the town, it was absolutely horrible. I read about this and I was like, that's horrible. We got included in, this is a horrible list. Number five, the hobble skirt. Yeah, so when people can't get out of burning theaters, it's stuff like this to blame. Just from this 1910 headline alone, I'm glad we don't have hobble skirts anymore. The June 12th, 1910 headline reads, the hobble skirt is the latest freak in women's fashions. The latest freak. Skirts that are so tight around the ankle that locomotion is seriously impeded and speed is impossible. Nice. I'll take two, debit. Doesn't that sound like a bad time? Why would anyone want this? Sounds like you're gonna be late for everything. French designer Paul Poirier made these to free the bust, to free the, you know, have a lot of room in here, whilst shackling the legs. So you in turn have to, you can't move. Just where you need to move around uneven stone roads, I guess. Love the practicality on this one, Paul, thanks. Despite how ridiculous and unsafe the hobble skirt looks and acts, only the wealthy could afford such a thing. Shoot, oh man, must be nice. I'll just be over here wearing jeans like an idiot. Middle and lower class women wore skirts with slits or buttons so they could, you know, actually walk around. Yeah, what fools. Oh, sorry, you want a button? <laughs> I don't speak broke, sweetie. Number four, lead based. When I started here at the studio a year and a half ago, maybe two years, I was like, okay, I gotta put on face cream maybe. A lot, of, a lot of lights, a lot of HD this. Time to get rid of these bags under my eyes finally. I don't know, maybe drink some water. See what happens. Finding a skincare routine of any sorts is easy now, dare I say. The lovely World Wide Web has our back. You can learn how to draw your eyebrows on while listening to true crime. It's wonderful where we are today. But the cosmetic game, whew, back in the 18th century, not great. Turns out it wasn't that great, not that safe. RuPaul's drag race would have been a lethal sport, know what I mean? Back in the 18th century, lead mixed with vinegar was often used to make your face look, you know, more pale. The Victorian look, I guess, gotta have those veins pop out. A splash of sulfur for those freckles, horrible idea. Queen Elizabeth I used cosmetics containing lead, mercury, and or arsenic, the same poison that took out George III and Napoleon Bonaparte, so not safe at all in any time, period. In fact, arsenic was on the priority list of hazardous substances, and toxic metal exposure is still an issue we're facing in this era, let alone Victorian. Number three, the Kensington system. Ah, oh, this was horrible. Queen Victoria was brought up under the Kensington system, which if you haven't heard it before is awful. I was grounded more often than not growing up, I'll admit, you know, I was the youngest of three, so I tried some shady stuff every now and then, but this, this is another level. At least I could go to the washroom without supervision, you know what I mean? Yeah, buckle up. Victoria's mother, Duchess Victoria of Kent, she created this Kensington system to control her daughter. She literally isolated the child from friends, family members, anybody, everybody, you name it. 
Her mother would monitor her every action on top of this, including who she can see or speak to, if there were any of those people at some point. Victoria only had two playmates growing up her entire life. She had her half-sister, Princess Fiodora of Lenigan, and then the Duchess attendant, Sir John Conroy, his daughter, Victoria. I mean, I had like four friends growing up, you know, maybe five, five and a half, but this is just cruel. This is just unfair. Especially with a royalty too, you'd think you can have more things. No, less. She shared a room with her mother until she was a queen. That entire time, she literally couldn't walk down the hallway alone. Victoria has reflected on her childhood, and yeah, in case you're wondering, she hates John Conrad. She referred to him as a demon incarnate, so she's got the words. Number two, arsenic dresses. If looks could kill, literally. You've heard of arsenic and old lace at some point, but what exactly are we talking about? Back in 1861, a poet by the name of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, real name, his wife, Fanny, also real name, her dress caught on fire and her burns were so bad that of course she sadly didn't survive. But this was sadly common in Victorian days. Puffy dresses, open candles as we heard earlier. These dresses back then, they were flammable as is, but some of them were made with literal poison. Some of them had arsenic made to have that like green look, like the real arsenic green look. It wasn't just in clothing either. Back in 1861, an artificial flower maker named Matilda Schurer used green arsenic laced powder and her fingernails had turned green and green foam started coming out of her mouth and it was just a horrible way to go out. Arsenic's not supposed to be inhaled, let alone worn. Although yeah, it did look nice for a hot minute. Not worth it. And finally, number one, Queen Victoria's threats. Being the queen and all, and we're talking about the Victorian era, I figured we'd end with this one. Being the queen and all, a security team is always needed, and during her reign, there were multiple, multiple attempts to harm the young queen. The first attack was back in 1840. It was an 18-year-old man named Edward Oxford, and he fired towards the queen's carriage, but obviously and luckily missed. But when Edward was accused of high treason, he was actually found not guilty due to insanity. Then a couple years later, in 1842, it happened again. This time, two men fired at her. They were found guilty. In 1849, her carriage was attacked by William Hamilton. In 1850, as the carriage was passing the gates of Buckingham Palace, Robert Pate, a retired soldier, ran up and hit her with his cane. Victoria was okay, thankfully, but of course, she was shook. Then again in 1842, 1849, and 1872, attempt after attempt. But then things got a little worse. If you haven't heard of Boy Jones or anything that happened here, I saved it for last because it's extremely unsettling. A teenager stalked the queen back in 1838 until 1841. Edward Jones, AKA Boy Jones. This guy somehow managed to break into Buckingham Palace more than once. It was some Assassin's Creed type stuff. He just knew some back way, he climbed some window or whatever. The guy just knew a route in. So he would break in and would more often than not just hide under the queen's sofa. He would sit on her throne sometimes and one of the worst things ever, he would go through her drawers and like go through her clothes and stuff, it was creepy. He would steal her clothes until eventually and thankfully he got caught. Of all the things you can do, of all the crimes you want to commit in the Victorian era, you're gonna go hide under a couch for five years? Okay, I'm glad he got caught, but just so weird. What a weird ending. Number 10, bottomless undies. I think I speak for everyone when I say that putting on a clean, fresh pair of underwear is a nice feeling. Gone is the brown underwear that was once white of yesterday, replaced with fresh loving linen of today. Now, if you're also like me, then you probably have some underwear with holes in it. I'll throw them out eventually, I'll, I'll get around to it, just I'll wear them a few more times first and then I'll get rid of them. But did you know that some ladies underwear in the Victorian era had no bottoms? Yeah. Part of the many layers of clothing that women were wearing back then, their underwear had no bottoms, which to me is the whole point of wearing bloomers in the first place. You gotta keep your business warm and packed away. I just don't understand what the point of having it all hang out is. That's just, that's just stupid. I don't know. Number nine, no razors. There's a joke about the 70s, George W. Bush and garden hedges here, but I'm gonna let you fill in the blanks. Basically, this is a time in history where you cannot hop in the whip and drive on over to your local hair razor dealership because there ain't no whips and there ain't no CVS. We're Shoppers Drug Mart if you're Canadian. Today, you can buy disposable razors pretty much anywhere and there's multiple models for doing so. When things get hairy, you got options. Women in the Victorian era were not so lucky. They had to go for the natural look. Now, not there's anything wrong with that, it's just, I feel like a girl's gonna have her options. She's gonna be able to, you know, do her own thing. Why not? Number eight. The Dirty Thames. When you think of Victorian England and the people, there's only really two classes, the wealthy and the ones who are broke 
and sound like they're from Peaky Blinders, love. Yeah, that's right. However, even for women of high esteem with their bottomless undies and lady mains growing a flush, the streets of Victorian London weren't very bourgeois, to say the least. Muddy dirt roads, thieves, beggars, and a really bad smell. It just didn't smell very nice. Oh, and also a really scary guy, but we'll get to that in part one. But perhaps the most disgusting was the Thames River, which after years of treating it the same way Brendan Fraser was treated after the Mummy franchise was over, it wasn't a good look. It was full of filth, sewage, garbage, and animal cadavers. So much so that it was said you could walk across the river on top of them. That is no place for a lady to be. Oof. Number seven, calf ear appetizers. This one goes out to all the folks who like their steak well done, as this may be too much to stomach. Given the way food was prepped and handled back then, I would agree with most folks that cooking the devil out of your meat was probably just the safer bet. Sucks for me because I like my steak rare, as rare as you can make it. Blue, almost, honestly. I, I love it like that. I am also willing to bet that most of you folks who like your steak well done aren't a big fan of fat and gristle. <laughs> I also love fat and grizzle. I just like meat, what can I say? What I'm getting to is calf ear appetizers. Yes, cooked calf ears, which I'm pretty sure are just like pure cartilage. Higher class women could often find themselves at parties where they would serve up this chewy delight. You'd probably just be chewing on that for a while. I feel like most people wouldn't like that. Is Chris a cartilage guy? I don't know, we'll see. Number six, hand cleavage. This goes for every inch of the skin, really, but women had to cover up back then. That means no ankles, neck, or God forbid a wrist. If a man saw a wrist, it would act, uh, ooh. Well, I don't know if they were that down bad, but women of higher esteem wore gloves. There's, there's etiquette to gloves. It was all part of the, the culture, which means only women with dosh could practice such glove etiquette. I say no woman should have the cover up. She should wear whatever the heck she wants when the heck she wants to. However, with the gloves, I believe there's a separate issue. I have an issue being a big dude with asthma. I sweat a lot more than the average folk. It just sucks, but if I was a fair lady with those gloves on, well, I might want to leave them on. Wouldn't want to ruin anyone's appetites for kaffir appetizers because the smell and the sweat, it just, ooh, it'd be gross, ooh. Number five, dress is too big. This is something I'm glad isn't a thing anymore. I, I'm not a person who likes to dress up. I'm a simple dude. Casual and comfortable is my forte. However, uncomfortable wearing suits is. I like to think I clean up well. And I understand sometimes you gotta wear drip. It's just how life goes. Sometimes you gotta dress up. I just don't think people should be showing up to any formal events in cowboy boots and a popped collar shirt. I've known a few of those people. But what I'm really talking about here is the obtuse size of women's dresses and just the whole culture of women's fashion back then. It was just crazy. Large and overbearing dresses with enough material to use as blankets when you sleep. I know that couldn't have been fun. It just, it's horrible. Especially with my sweat problem. A few hours in a suit and maybe a few beers later and the first thing I'm trying to do is take the suit off. It gets tight and sweaty in there and it's just a lot of material. It's just, it's just too much. Too much. And doorways, trying to get through doorway. Ugh. Forget about it. Number four, fava beans. Well, after all that sweating and being around all that foulness, ladies needed to detox. How about a nice face mask made of beef? Yes, that's right. To keep their skin young and beautiful, they would drape a slice of beef over their face. Nothing like a little Hannibal Lecter before bedtime. Now, I hear you saying, well, Chad, that's not that bad. Okay, but think about this, though. For the time period, that beef was probably yucky due to food processing practices of the time. And, and there's just no fridges. That means it was stinky. I hope it was at least winter before these ladies decided to beef up like that. This process of beef was supposed to rejuvenate the skin because beef contains some important vitamins for such. I just, I can't recommend that. You just walk in with the beef and, hello, darling, yes. Ugh, gross. Number three, hot Christmas. This is just so dumb. I'm just gonna go ahead and tell everyone at home right now not to do this, because I know some of you, and some of you are gonna be like, oh, thanks, Chetty, that's cool. No, don't do it. I'm a doctor, a lawyer, and a firefighter. Basically, this was a super fun game that felt like something out of Johnny Knoxville's head, not Victorian families gathering at Christmas. Basically, they would gather at Christmas to play a game called Snapdragon. You get a bowl of raisins and almonds, you pour some brandy in there, and maybe one out for your homie, and ignite the brandy. Once the bowl is on fire, the family will compete to see who can grab the flaming treats and eat them the fastest. 
Okay, second degree burns are not how I want to spend my holiday season. And also, in a time before smoke alarms and a modern fire service, this sounds like a really bad time. Grandpa could lose it out of his hands. Drapes catch fire, the house burns down, probably the whole neighborhood. Just a bad idea. Also, I hate raisins, so setting them on fire? Yeah, I'm out. I don't like raisins. They're gross, dude. I don't like them. Number two, crypt picks. Look, it's a part of life. It happens. You live, you love, and depending on how much your wife likes interior design, you probably have a sign hanging up like that in your home somewhere that says something like that. You know what I'm talking about. And after spending all that time in home sense, it's all over. Fade the black, cease to exist, the forever box. There's a whole process and respect in the undertaking business. The Victorian era had a strange tradition, however. How about taking photographs with the body of a family member who has recently passed on? Yeah, that's right, I know. I couldn't believe it, really. People would sit there for minutes taking photos of those who are no longer with us because the process of taking photos was not great. This isn't the digital age, after all. This is something that the Crypt Keeper would make you do. Keep just, and, and keep them in the album or something. Just, just not, not for your everyday family, man. That's just weird. Yeah, so now we're going to take photos. <laughs> like, that's just weird, you know what I mean? It's just weird, it's weird. Number one, Jack the Ripper. Listen, the women of Victorian London feared this guy, and how can you blame them? A terror that seemed to come from nowhere and could strike from anywhere. Humans unaliving other humans is nothing new, and it probably won't be old, it won't get old soon. We, we're, this is what we do, it's kind of our thing. But this was the first modern serial unaliver. Jack the Ripper's identity has never been found. It's only been speculated, and some studies suggest that it has been revealed, but it's really hard to pinpoint something that happened that long ago. He was nasty, and the crimes were awful. The photographs of the crime scene do not exactly follow today's media rules or decency, as it's really just horrible, and it's just really messy and bloody and just gross. It's kind of hard to talk about this era without Jack the Ripper. Women should feel safe at night no matter what era it is. That's right, ladies, I'm on your side. In 10th place, we have deadly party games. So back in the day, board games weren't the massive industry they are today, and Victorians loved their parlor games, even more so when they risked their lives doing it. Because, you know, why not? One such game was called Snapdragon, and involved pouring raisins into a bowl, soaking them in rum, and setting them on fire before scrambling to remove as many raisins as possible, and chomp them down while they were still aflame. Because, you know, why not? Another game was called Hot Cockles, and I couldn't make all of this up if I tried. Blindfolded and with your head in someone's lap, partygoers would take turns kicking you in the rear end, and then you uh, had to guess who it was that kicked you. This sounds not only uncomfortable from the start, but like it could quickly get out of hand, and my tailbone hurts thinking about it. Yet another game was called Cellar Stairs, and involved walking backwards down a flight of stairs using a handheld mirror as your only guide. Supposedly the features of your future mate would appear in the mirror, but it seems more likely that you would just, you know, fall down the stairs, and I know I would've. My balance is not the best. Finally, there's the Candle and Apple game, sometimes called Snap Apple. The game was so popular in the 18th and 19th century and Halloween was often referred to as Snap Apple Night. Candles and apples would be hung from the ceiling, and the goal is to get a bite of the apple without consuming any wax or getting burned. As a former altar girl who used to play with wax, youch! I can't imagine just how much that would hurt my face. Also, I think I found where uh, Ready or Not got its inspiration. In ninth place, we have hats made from taxidermy birds. Not gonna lie, I'm not the biggest fan of taxidermy, even though I have a friend who has a museum in his home that has more than a few pieces. Granted, he mostly focuses on albino taxidermy. But, hey. To each their own. What began as a few plumes from herons, jays, and you know, pheasants tucked into the brims of headwear became a wildly popular trend, which the fashion industry capitalized on by going to the extreme, adding entire taxidermy birds to very tall hats, as well as stuffed hummingbirds to decorative hand fans. According to the Victorianist, millinery fashion took a truly bizarre turn in the 1880s, when hat crowns grew tall, offering a generous display area for, in the most extreme examples, an extraordinary array of animals, including cats and squirrels. I I don't even want to imagine the amount of flies that would be circling, you know, around hats that was still a trend in today's world. How warm things are thanks to global warming. Also, I rave for neck health since I doubt those hats were very light, and as someone who has worn a couple of very heavy wigs in my lifetime, they tend to take a toll. In eighth place, we have Victorian death photographs. So photographs of loved ones taken after they died may seem kind of morbid by today's standards, but in Victorian England, they were a way of commemorating the dead and blunting the sharpness of grief. Remember, unless you were rich enough to have a painting commissioned, there really wasn't a way to preserve visual proof that someone existed and how they looked for future generations. In images that are both unsettling and strangely, you know, fitting, families poised with the dead and consumptive young ladies elegantly recline. The disease not only taking their life, but, you know, increasing their beauty. Victorian life was full of death. 
Epidemics such as diphtheria, typhus, and cholera scarred the country, and from 1861 onwards, the bereaved queen made mourning fashionable. Trinkets of memento mori, meaning remember you must die, took several forms and existed long before Victorian times. Long exposures when taking photographs meant that the dead were often seen more sharply than the slightly burned living, because of their lack of movement. On some occasions, eyes would be painted onto the photograph after it was developed, which was meant to make the deceased more lifelike, while other times death was a lot more obvious. Locks of hair cut from the dead were arranged and worn in lockets and rings. Death masks were created in wax, and the images and symbols of death appeared in paintings and sculptures. But in the mid 1800s, photography was becoming increasingly popular and affordable, leading to memento mori photographic portraiture. Try saying that five times fast. The first successful form of photography, the daguerreotype, was an expensive luxury, but not nearly as costly as having a portrait painted, which, like I said before, that was the only way you could do it first. As the number of photographers increased, the cost of daguerreotypes fell. Less costly procedures were introduced in the 1850s, such as using thin metal, glass, or paper rather than silver. Pricey, pricey silver. In seventh place, we have uses for arsenic. Pardon me, uses other than ending lives. But you know, that also makes me want to consider a top 10 creative ways to dispose of people. Martha Ponder. Arsenic invaded almost every aspect of life in 19th century Britain, leaving a toll of death and illness. A byproduct of an emerging smelting industry, arsenic was cheap and readily available as rat killer by uh, the early 1800s. It was also odorless and tasteless, and easily confused with flour or sugar or other cooking essentials. By the mid 1800s, 1930s, morbid descriptions of death from arsenic terrified the public and became a staple of the British popular press. But most of the fatalities from arsenic were more pedestrian, from accidental use in food or from exposure to arsenical compounds in consumer goods such as fabric dyes and wallpapers in facilities that meet these products and in the polluted air. Arsenic was used even in medications to treat everything from asthma and cancer to reduce libido and skin problems. Now, Victorians were just as obsessed with their bodies as we are, if not more dangerously. Many women used arsenic to fight wrinkles and men swallowed arsenic tablets as kind of a pre-Pfizer Viagra. It's unclear if arsenic can actually be used to um, turn compasses to true north, but it doesn't seem advisable to try it. I feel like there are much safer ways to get a uh, motor running, if you will. In sixth place, we have wasp wastes. We all know that corsets were a thing in the Victorian era, but they were much more extreme than most people might think. Many women cinched themselves down until they had very tiny wasp wastes. With super snug corsets that didn't just rearrange your insides, they made it impossible to breathe. Now, before anyone starts calling all corsets or stays awful to wear, they're only bad for your health if you're trying to accomplish the above improperly. As a gal who corsets often for fashion and posture purposes, I've only ever experienced discomfort when they weren't properly fitted, like when, or when I was wearing them for too long, or when I was wearing the combination of a too small steel boned one outdoors in the cold for too long. But this is a do as I say and not as I do kind of situation, since that was like a one time thing and my ribs have very much learned their lesson. Long story short, corsets are not bad, you just have to wear them properly. You trust me, right? In fifth place, we have grave robbing. Now, my my first thought when I said that just now was Grave Robber the character, which only goes to show how much repo the genetic opera has wrought in my brain. One of the most lucrative side hustles of the Victorian era was grave robbing, and the fresher the corpse, the better. Medical students needed cadavers to study, so a black market of corpses arose, enriching adventurous thieves and uh, angering families of the dearly departed. The 19th century was also a fertile age of exploration, and one of the most impressive discoveries were ancient mummies that the people of Victorian England brought home from Egyptian vacations. They'd invite all of their friends over for unwrapping parties, which tended to be rather grim spectacles, that nevertheless delighted the morbid weirdos. Look, while I don't condone it, I wouldn't mind time traveling back to be a fly on the wall at those parties, since I I definitely classify myself as a morbid weirdo. At one notable gathering for the unwrapping of Nescons, the second wife of Theban high priest Pinojem II was placed in a contraption that made her appear to dance. The demand for mummies to take home was so high that Egyptians started transporting them from less visited ruins to areas that had a lot more traffic. Hey, whatever helps the economy. In fourth place, we have garden hermits. So the next time somebody shows off their garden to you, make sure to ask where they keep their hermit. And if they don't have one, make sure to comment on how undignified it is. In the Victorian era, wealthy families hired people to don full hermit garb, complete with robes, long hair, beards, and hermit glasses, and live as an ornamental garden hermit on their land. The biggest rule of all though, no speaking to anyone on the property. And honestly, sounds like a dream job to me. Ugh, being paid in house to not speak to anyone and just be like a silly little decoration feature? Sounds like upgraded background work, and I will totally take it. Granted, that's if someone wants like a spooky ooky gothic garden feature. I'm all yours. In third place, we have shock treatment. No, I'm not talking about the cursed as all get out sequel to Rocky Horror, but more people should be. 
I've only watched it once, but it does have some bops for sure. In the 19th century, Victorians thought electrotherapy could fix everything from gout to muscle problems. All you had to do was pay your local electrotherapist who shocked the problem area, but really all it did was leave a lot of people with icky scars. In more modern times though, it has been refined to work well for muscle issues, but it uh, wasn't always that way. In second place, we have weird face masks. Patented in 1875, Madame Raleigh's face mask was strapped to a woman's head overnight, three nights per week. That was how you do it, you followed the rules. Made of flexible India rubber, the mask could be filled with unguents and all manners of salves and bleaches to uh, treat the skin. However, the mask did have a second purpose, which was to make the face sweat all night long. Also called the face glove, the device would excite perspiration with a view to soften and clarify the skin by relieving the pores and the superficial circulation. Inventor Helen Raleigh claimed the mask could be used by persons suffering with certain forms of disease or afflicted with a bad complexion, which came in the form of cutaneous eruptions, blotches, pimples, freckles, or fugitive discolorations, and for clogged pores and capillary congestion. So a uh, cure-all? Now this mask became very, very popular and uh, led to some market competition. One improved overnight mask was made of flannel, while another complained that existing masks didn't allow for poisonous gases to escape, so she proposed layers of chamois and satin. And hey, if all else failed, Victorian women layered raw beef or veal over their faces before bed. I love a good face mask as much as the next person, but um, I think I'll stick with what I already know. In first place, we have corpse medicine. The Victorian era ushered in the tail end of corpse medicine, which was the practice of ingesting different parts of the human body to cure various ailments. One popular drink to cure apoplexy mixed powdered human skull and chocolate, while the most coveted remedy mixed skull with uh, booze to each their own. By the 19th century, most doctors had uh, moved away from this barbarous practice, but medical texts and cookbooks that explained you know, how to best repair a body part suggested that it was far from uh, dead. To get fresh supplies, people often went to an executioner rather than a pharmacist, paying good money for the freshest of fresh products as recommended by a doctor that was shockingly not accused of being a vampire. I even found a recipe for uh, red fluid marmalade. And that brings us to the end of our list, and uh, people really used to do the craziest things. I'll stick to my modern traditions that are a little less uh, life-threatening. In 10th place, we have deadly party games. So back in the day, board games weren't the massive industry they are today, and Victorians loved their parlor games, even more so when they risked their lives doing it. Because, you know, why not? One such game was called Snapdragon and involved pouring raisins into a bowl, soaking them in rum, and setting them on fire before scrambling to remove as many raisins as possible and chomp them down while they were still aflame. Because, you know, why not? Another game was called Hot Cockles, and I couldn't make all of this up if I tried. Blindfolded and with your head in someone's lap, partygoers would take turns kicking you in the rear end, and then you uh, had to guess who it was that kicked you. This sounds not only uncomfortable from the start, but like it could quickly get out of hand, and my tailbone hurts thinking about it. Yet another game was called Cellar Stairs, and involved walking backwards down a flight of stairs using a handheld mirror as your only guide. Supposedly the features of your future mate would appear in the mirror, but it seems more likely that you would just, you know, fall down the stairs, and I know I would have. My balance is not the best. Finally, there's the Candle and Apple game, sometimes called Snap Apple. The game was so popular in the 18th and 19th centuries that Halloween was often referred to as Snap Apple Night. Candles and apples would be hung from the ceiling, and the goal is to get a bite of the apple without consuming any wax or getting burned. As a former altar girl who used to play with wax, youch! I can't imagine just how much that would hurt my face. Also, I think I found where uh, Ready or Not got its inspiration. In ninth place, we have hats made from taxidermy birds. Not gonna lie, I'm not the biggest fan of taxidermy, even though I have a friend who has a museum in his home that has more than a few pieces. Granted, he mostly focuses on albino taxidermy. But, hey. To each their own. What began as a few plumes from herons, jays, and you know, pheasants tucked into the brims of headwear became a wildly popular trend, which the fashion industry capitalized on by going to the extreme, adding entire taxidermy birds to very tall hats, as well as stuffed hummingbirds to decorative hand fans. According to the Victorianist, millinery fashion took a truly bizarre turn in the 1880s, when hat crowns grew tall, offering a generous display area for, in the most extreme examples, an extraordinary array of animals, including cats and squirrels. I I don't even want to imagine the amount of flies that would be circling, you know, around hats that was still a trend in today's world. How warm things are thanks to global warming. Also, I rave for neck health since I doubt those hats were very light, and as someone who has worn a couple of very heavy wigs in my lifetime, they tend to take a toll. In eighth place, we have Victorian death photographs. So photographs of loved ones taken after they died may seem kind of morbid by today's standards, but in Victorian England, they were a way of commemorating the dead and blunting the sharpness of grief. Remember, unless you were rich enough to have a painting commissioned, there really wasn't a way to preserve visual proof that someone existed and how they looked for future generations. In images that are both unsettling and strangely, you know, fitting, families poised with the dead and consumptive young ladies elegantly reclined, the disease not only taking their life, but, you know, increasing their beauty. Victorian life was full of death. 
Epidemics such as diphtheria, typhus, and cholera scarred the country, and from 1861 onwards, the bereaved queen made mourning fashionable. Trinkets of memento mori, meaning remember you must die, took several forms and existed long before Victorian times. Long exposures when taking photographs meant that the dead were often seen more sharply than the slightly burned living, because of their lack of movement. On some occasions, eyes would be painted onto the photograph after it was developed, which was meant to make the deceased more lifelike, while other times death was a lot more obvious. Locks of hair cut from the dead were arranged and worn in lockets and rings. Death masks were created in wax, and the images and symbols of death appeared in paintings and sculptures. But in the mid 1800s, photography was becoming increasingly popular and affordable, leading to memento mori photographic portraiture. Try saying that five times fast. The first successful form of photography, the daguerreotype, was an expensive luxury, but not nearly as costly as having a portrait painted, which, like I said before, that was the only way you could do it first. As the number of photographers increased, the cost of daguerreotypes fell. Less costly procedures were introduced in the 1850s, such as using thin metal, glass, or paper rather than silver. Pricey, pricey silver. In seventh place, we have uses for arsenic. Pardon me, uses other than ending lives. But you know, that also makes me want to consider a top 10 creative ways to dispose of people. Martha Ponder. Arsenic invaded almost every aspect of life in 19th century Britain, leaving a toll of death and illness. A byproduct of an emerging smelting industry, arsenic was cheap and readily available as rat killer by uh, the early 1800s. It was also odorless and tasteless, and easily confused with flour or sugar or other cooking essentials. By the mid 1800s, 1930s, morbid descriptions of death from arsenic terrified the public and became a staple of the British popular press. But most of the fatalities from arsenic were more pedestrian, from accidental use in food or from exposure to arsenical compounds in consumer goods such as fabric dyes and wallpapers in facilities that meet these products and in the polluted air. Arsenic was used even in medications to treat everything from asthma and cancer to reduce libido and skin problems. Now, Victorians were just as obsessed with their bodies as we are, if not more dangerously. Many women used arsenic to fight wrinkles and men swallowed arsenic tablets as kind of a pre-Pfizer Viagra. It's unclear if arsenic can actually be used to um, turn compasses to true north, but it doesn't seem advisable to try it. I feel like there are much safer ways to get a uh, motor running, if you will. In sixth place, we have wasp wastes. We all know that corsets were a thing in the Victorian era, but they were much more extreme than most people might think. Many women cinched themselves down until they had very tiny wasp waists. With super snug corsets that didn't just rearrange your insides, they made it impossible to breathe. Now, before anyone starts calling all corsets or stays awful to wear, they're only bad for your health if you're trying to accomplish the above improperly. As a gal who corsets often for fashion and posture purposes, I've only ever experienced discomfort when they weren't properly fitted, like when, or when I was wearing them for too long, or when I was wearing the combination of a too small steel boned one outdoors in the cold for too long. But this is a do as I say and not as I do kind of situation, since that was like a one time thing and my ribs have very much learned their lesson. Long story short, corsets are not bad, you just have to wear them properly. You trust me, right? In fifth place, we have grave robbing. Now, my first thought when I said that just now was Grave Robber the character, which only goes to show how much repo the genetic opera has wrought in my brain. One of the most lucrative side hustles of the Victorian era was grave robbing, and the fresher the corpse, the better. Medical students needed cadavers to study, so a black market of corpses arose, enriching adventurous thieves and uh, angering families of the dearly departed. The 19th century was also a fertile age of exploration. One of the most impressive discoveries were ancient mummies that the people of Victorian England brought home from Egyptian vacations. They'd invite all of their friends over for unwrapping parties, which tended to be rather grim spectacles that nevertheless delighted the morbid weirdos. Look, while I don't condone it, I wouldn't mind time traveling back to be a fly on the wall at those parties, since I definitely classify myself as a morbid weirdo. At one notable gathering for the unwrapping of Nescons, the second wife of Theban high priest Pinojem II was placed in a contraption that made her appear to dance. The demand for mummies to take home was so high that Egyptians started transporting them from less visited ruins to areas that had a lot more traffic. Hey, whatever helps the economy. In fourth place, we have garden hermits. So the next time somebody shows off their garden to you, make sure to ask where they keep their hermit. And if they don't have one, make sure to comment on how undignified it is. In the Victorian era, wealthy families hired people to don full hermit garb, complete with robes, long hair, beards, and hermit glasses, and live as an ornamental garden hermit on their land. The biggest rule of all though, no speaking to anyone on the property. And honestly, sounds like a dream job to me. Ugh, being paid in house to not speak to anyone and just be like a silly little decoration feature? Sounds like upgraded background work, and I will totally take it. Granted, that's if someone wants like a spooky ooky gothic garden feature. I'm all yours. In third place, we have shock treatment. No, I'm not talking about the cursed as all get out sequel to Rocky Horror, but more people should be. I've only watched it once, but it does have some bops for sure. In the 19th century, Victorians thought electrotherapy could fix everything from gout to muscle problems. All you had to do was pay your local electrotherapist who shocked the problem area, but 
really all it did was leave a lot of people with icky scars. In more modern times though, it has been refined to work well for muscle issues, but it uh, wasn't always that way. In second place, we have weird face masks. Patented in 1875, Madame Raleigh's face mask was strapped to a woman's head overnight, three nights per week. That was how you do it, you followed the rules. Made of flexible India rubber, the mask could be filled with unguents and all manners of salves and bleaches to uh, treat the skin. However, the mask did have a second purpose, which was to make the face sweat all night long. Also called the face glove, the device would excite perspiration with a view to soften and clarify the skin by relieving the pores and the superficial circulation. Inventor Helen Raleigh claimed the mask could be used by persons suffering with certain forms of disease or afflicted with a bad complexion, which came in the form of cutaneous eruptions, blotches, pimples, freckles, or fugitive discolorations, and for clogged pores and capillary congestion. So a uh, cure-all? Now, this mask became very, very popular and uh, led to some market competition. One improved overnight mask was made of flannel, while another complained that existing masks didn't allow for poisonous gases to escape, so she proposed layers of chamois and satin. And hey, if all else failed, Victorian women layered raw beef or veal over their faces before bed. I love a good face mask as much as the next person, but um, I think I'll stick with what I already know. In first place, we have corpse medicine. The Victorian era ushered in the tail end of corpse medicine, which was the practice of ingesting different parts of the human body to cure various ailments. One popular drink to cure apoplexy mixed powdered human skull and chocolate, while the most coveted remedy mixed skull with uh, booze to each their own. By the 19th century, most doctors had uh, moved away from this barbarous practice, but medical texts and cookbooks that explained you know, how to best repair a body part suggested that it was far from uh, dead. To get fresh supplies, people often went to an execution rather than a pharmacist, paying good money for the freshest of fresh products as recommended by a doctor that was shockingly not accused of being a vampire. I even found a recipe for uh, red fluid marmalade. Number 10, tool skirts. Tool skirts were a major problem. Although these were chiefly worn by ballerinas, ballet has always been a destructive form of dance when it comes to basically how it affects the body. I mean, many ballerinas literally have their toenails fall off as a result of dancing on point. That's just kind of like an assumed part of the profession if you're dancing point. However, we aren't even talking about the feet here. We're actually talking about how safe the costumes are, the literal garments they dance around in, not even their shoes or their feet. The answer to that question, they're not very safe. Considering that before electricity, many danced on candlelit stages, you'd likely be horrified to hear just how flammable these costumes were. There are many examples throughout history of ballerinas and dancers getting too close to candle flames while in their costumes and basically lighting on fire. And I gotta say, I've listened to multiple podcasts that have talked about this, so I could recommend some to you. If you want some, let me know in the comments. I'll send them your way. Emma Livery is by far one of the most famous ballerinas, though, to have caught flame. She actually did initially survive the incident, but she died eight months later as a result of her injuries. That sounds terrible. And there were honestly countless others who suffered similar fates. The really terrible thing is, back in the day, this is something new that I found out, we actually had the means to make fire retardant costumes, but they affected the aesthetic of the costumes, making the costumes appear a little bit more stiff. So rather than try to save the more than thousands of ballerinas who died in even just a single year, we decided to opt for beauty over safety. To me, that's pretty scandalous, I'm gonna be honest. Scandalous and disappointing. And friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Bumblebee and you love learning history with us, be sure to let us know by clicking that subscribe button. Honestly, we got a lot of fun facts for you and I don't want you to miss out. Number nine, showing some shoulder. Ooh. <laughs> The crazy thing is we actually just came from an era before this when showing shoulders was actually considered very fashionable. But by the time the Victorian era really started to kick into gear, this was actually considered completely improper. Paintings even had to be repainted to reflect this new trend because showing a bit of shoulder literally frightened some people. They were like, oh, I can't look at it. Repaint that painting, cover those shoulders up. I'm not joking, that's a real thing. And don't even get me started on cleavage. Shoulders were previously considered to be something beautifully showcased from gowns that had both lower and wider necklines. This was considered beautiful and sexy in a good way. But with puritanical views taking over anything considered too beautiful and definitely anything considered sexy would be seen as bad and sinful. So we had to cover those shoulders up. <laughs> Man, if I traveled back to the Victorian era right now, they'd be like, girl, what you doing with those shoulders? 
Sorry, my shoulders and my ankles are out today. Oh, scandalous. Number eight, the gall dress. Well, Mary Antoinette was not around during the Victorian era, living and dying just before it began, really. Her presence was felt in regards to the mark that she left on the fashion scene. Mary Antoinette was often seen as a woman of scandal, not just because of the stories of her love affairs and her actually being misquoted here as responding to the poor, starving people of France by saying, let them eat cake but also because of her fashion sense. While by today's standards, Marie Antoinette would be seen as probably being overdressed among us, by her time standards, she was often seen as presenting herself as immoral, with many of her dresses resembling more undergarments of the day than the usual more modest finery and typical style. Case and point a portrait that was done in her chemise style dress known as a gall by painter Vigie Le Brun was condemned for how it portrayed the monarch. People actually admired Le Brun's work in terms of the painting itself but didn't like the dress that she had painted the queen in as they felt it appeared too intimate and informal. As a result the painting was actually removed from display and Vigie was forced to repaint Marie Antoinette's dress into something more formal and fitting. Because it's just it's too risque. We were like, we can't look at the queen like this. It looks terrible. Repaint it. <laughs> I don't know why I'm making everyone British when we're in France, but there you go. <laughs> Number seven, fainting room. By today's standards, fainting rooms might seem quite scandalous. And while they were very fashionable back in the day, often being linked to corsets, at least so we think, in reality, fainting rooms actually had less to do with corsets and more to do with people's desires to nap without having to bother with all the business of undressing, getting in bed, getting back up, having the bed remade, and completely redressing. Instead, fainting rooms were a place where you could sneak off to for some peace and quiet during a busy afternoon or major social event or simply a place you could just go to rest for a bit without having to do the whole sleep time ritual that usually accompanied, you know, going to bed. What's more scandalous is the fact that the women who were known to actually faint back in the day, that is true, and even today women still faint, people still faint, had this malady attached to corsets by physicians. Usually, of course, men back in the day who simply just didn't know what was wrong with these women to make them faint so much. So what did they do? They blamed corsets, of course. Although to be fair, corsets are notoriously bad for your health. But still, I just love that these doctors were like, I don't know what's wrong with this woman. Corsets. They make her faint. That's what it is. Probably iron deficiency, heat, being overdressed in the heat. There's a lot of reasons why people faint. Number six, Shields Green. This dye color became super popular in the Victorian era, but is also known for being literally made out of poison. If you're worried that women of the day didn't know that at the time, uh, nah. They were actually informed on this, yet they still chose to wear this color because, I mean, it was simply too gorgeous. Hey, it's worth it. A little bit of arsenic poisoning, no problem. It did cause symptoms of arsenic poisoning among those who wore the dresses dyed with this color because I mean, it's dye, it's, this fabric is still rubbing up against your skin, still getting absorbed through your pores, but it actually caused even more harm to those who made and dyed the garments with it because, you know, they're the ones actually breathing that in and stuff. Yikes. Number five, bloomers. Bloomers were one of the first styles of pants women gravitated towards in the Victorian era. They were worn in rebellion of the often unruly skirts of the day, which made it hard to move around and, well, honestly, probably do anything. Female cyclists instead preferred to wear bloomers, causing much scandal as people felt it was improper for women to dress so masculinely. How dare you? Basically, bloomers are like more floofy pants is how I would describe them, and people felt that pants should be reserved for men to wear. Even the floofy ones, they were like, women can't have any pants, not even floofy pants. I gotta say, I would totally rock some Victorian era bloomers and be causing all the scandals myself if I were around back then. They definitely look more comfy than pretty much almost everything else women were wearing. The bloomers got their name from a prominent American feminist of the time, Amelia Bloomer, though she herself did not invent them, but she was a person that basically spoke out and was like, I, why can't women wear pants? Although Amelia Bloomer did fight hard for women's rights, she herself is not someone I believe we should just straight up glorify, to be clear. She also said some pretty terrible things about Native Americans, and she also seemed to be content with civilians taking the law into their own hands and literally hanging people deemed 
undesirable in their community. So it's a big yikes from me. Number four, corset. Corsets didn't originate in the Victorian era, but they definitely became iconic in regards to the fashion of that time period. That's because slim waists, they came back into fashion, baby. They also became iconic for the fact that they were causing great damage to the people wearing them. Well, I too do love to don a corset from time to time. It is important to make sure that you don't push it when you're wearing them, and it's important to remember that this extreme form of shapewear literally has a history of moving people's insides around as a result of wearing them daily or even just regularly. Honestly, even me wearing it every now and then is not good for you. Just corsets aren't good for you. So even just wearing a corset, you know, every now and then, it's not good probably shouldn't do it. I probably shouldn't do it, but am I gonna do it? Yeah, probably. And even back in the Victorian era, when they were trending again, we knew that corsets were bad for you. And it made this item quite the risque one, despite it at the time being coveted and widely used by many out there. That was actually like even a topic back then. People were like, shouldn't people be wearing these? This seems dangerous. Number three, flashing. Some ankle. <laughs> can't see it on camera, I can't show it to you because it'd be too scandalous, so scandalous. As silly as this sounds now, especially with it being summer right now, as I'm talking about this, a time when being underdressed is really just being comfortable. This was, in fact, a huge thing in the Victorian era. Women were often covered head to toe from the top of the neck all the way down to the ankles. It was common for women to even wear multiple long skirts and stockings in an attempt to just fully cover their legs and ankles. So those who decided to flash a little bit of ankle with their fashion choices, whoo, they were considered quite risque. Number two, hoop skirts. As deadly as they were definitely fashionable during part of the Victorian era. The hoop skirt, also known as caged crinoline, was a type of skirt that was built like a cage. There's various different ones which were made out of different materials, but the idea is it's literally a big hoop cage that you wear and then you put a dress over top of that, or a skirt over top of that. The idea was to add volume to the bottom of your outfit, which would also help to make your waist look even slimmer. Something that was very fashionable back in the day and something still coveted by many in regards to modern beauty standards today. Hoop skirts though were deadly because you would often misjudge the size of your skirt, which could cause all kinds of accidents. Also, many of the materials used to build the hoop skirts and dresses that went over top were very flammable. Many people died from catching fire or getting their skirts caught in machinery or even carriage wheels. So yeah, don't wear a hoop skirt if you have to do anything or be, be near flames or just be alive in the Victorian era because there were open flames like everywhere. <laughs> number one, the one piece. I like that I saved this one for number one. I didn't realize I was doing that, but I knew subconsciously. The one piece swimsuit created quite the controversy when it, it came into fashion near the end of the Victorian era. And the really wild thing is it initially pretty much covered almost like your entire body. But, and it's a big but for this era, it was very fitted. So because it hugged the body, as swimwear really should do so that you can, you know, actually swim, it was considered to be quite scandalous. Not only that, but of course the one piece also wanted to maintain your modesty by not having your skirt float up in the water around you, giving everyone potentially a free show. So it was fashion to be pants, you know? Oh boy, a woman in pants without a skirt? Scandalous. Number 10, Queen Victoria. It's all by herself. Her Royal Majesty and Queen of the British Empire. Queen Victoria, she's responsible for a lot of things, including a nice long holiday in the summer where dads get to be irresponsible with fireworks. Nice. All fun jokes aside, she was the queen of the monarch and she wasn't the worst queen ever, but uh, during her reign, the British Empire had never really been stronger as it took part in absorbing many smaller nations into the empire. And they didn't ask nicely if you catch my drift. India, China, and uh, a lot of parts of Africa. Africa had a rough time back then. It was pretty hard for that continent. They all felt the wrath of the queen's expansionist fist. It's really sad, actually. Goddamn. Number nine, Thebes. Times, specifically in Victorian London, weren't the best. It most certainly wasn't the cleanliest place on earth, and there were orphans asking for more porridge. I don't know. I didn't read the book, guys. Sorry. Lack of rights, social expectations and pressure, and a lot of double standards. Honestly, it just wasn't an easy time for women. Well, it shouldn't really come as a surprise, but thievery and pickpocketing were often done even by women, though. I mean, what choice do you have at that point? The idea of ladies was so 
ladylike or elegant that it wasn't possible, or at least people thought it wasn't possible, that they could be criminals. What a backhanded compliment. What, a woman a criminal? I certainly don't think so, sir. It's not possible. It's very possible. There are tons of thieves and pickpockets. That's just ridiculous. Number eight, Jane Toppin. Take a trip with me to Boston. We can see Bunker Hill, Old North Church, and Fanu Hall. Ooh, cool. We could also visit a very nice nurse from the 1880s who was taking care of the elderly. Jolly Jane, as she became to be known, was a nurse who took care of the elderly. And by take care, I mean the same way you took care of your first hamster. Mmm, yeah, not so great, was it? Now, how did he know that? I know. She would dose up the old geezers with a healthy Keith Richards sized dose of morphine. Yeah! There's only so much rock stars that can handle that level of rock and roll. And guys, grandma and grandpa, they're not one of them. They can't handle that kind of stuff. After that, she would lay down with them and just like chill with the body, cause that's, that's what you do. Ugh. Before she was caught, there was an estimated 31 grandmas and grandpas not at the dinner table after having her as a nurse. I'm just gonna lay down right beside you. It's gonna be great. Just gonna lay down. <laughs> Number seven, Typhoid Mary. My mom wasn't the best cook on planet Earth, but God willing, she tried. You know, she she really put in a lot of work. Excuse the meme here, but she makes a mean spaghetti though. God, I love mom's spaghetti. I really, I really do. And her cookies. Oh, she makes the best cookies. Everyone should agree with me in the comment section so I can show my mom and tell her she hasn't made cookies in a while. Tell my mom to mix with cookies. It's time she makes cookies, man. They're so freaking good. They're the best on earth, I swear. Oh, well, my mother is okay. She doesn't make up the Gordon Ramsay standards, but that's okay because no matter how well Typhoid Mary made the lamb sauce, it was always gonna make people green as Typhoid Mary was an asymptomatic carrier of typhoid fever. Yes, that's what we're talking about, Typhoid Mary. Crazy enough, after she found out that she was asymptomatic with typhoid, she insisted upon cooking. She kept going, which got more people sick. Surprise. She was forcibly quarantined multiple times in her life. You can't make this stuff up. Please stop cooking, you're sick. I'm gonna do what I want, you can't tell me what to do. Number six, Bell Star. You know, for those who enjoy adult entertainment, her name kind of sounds like it came from there, right? Anyway, she was a cowgirl and outlaw in the 1880s and in the Lone Star State. She was married to an Indian and oftentimes as a couple would offer help to other outlaws needing refuge at their ranch. In 1883, her and her husband were caught trying to steal a horse, very RDR of them, hmm, and spent time in the old slammer. They continued their outlaw ways until it all went Dutch Vanderlyn, meaning it didn't go very well. One day, like any other good western, a stranger had come to the ranch, kind of out of nowhere, and gave Bell Star a taste of the law. Just happened to be with a big iron. To this day, nobody knows what happened, who the stranger was, or why she was bang bang. No one, no one knows. No one, no one. It's crazy. There, was, there should be a movie about that. Big iron on his hip, all fancy anyway. Number five, Mary Surratt. I actually didn't know this one, but perhaps maybe our American audience remembers. Some will recall a time when America was divided in twain. After all, a house divided amongst itself cannot stand. A certain top-hatted bearded president did his best to restore the union. It took a lot of years and lives, but he managed to do it. However, some were still not pleased, a one John Wilkes Booth to be specific had to ask the president a leaded question, if you catch my drift. Well, after assassinating one of the most beloved presidents in American history, he needed to hide. You, you gotta hide after that. And Mary Surratt was the woman who'd let him hide. So I think aiding and abetting, as well as harboring the most wanted man in America at the time, counts as scandalous. She also had some other anti-union behavior as well. Hmm, that's not good. Nazi, Nazi, not very nice. Number four, Lizzie Borden. Lizzie Borden took in gave her mother 40 wax. When she saw what she had done, she gave her father 41. Huh, isn't that nice? <laughs> oh boy. Yes, that's right, the late 1800s teenage daughter who maybe perhaps pulled an OJ Simpson. Nah, we're not sure, I don't know. Maybe she did not sort of brutally unalive her families. <laughs> no one else was found at the scene and then she was acquitted. That sounds just like OJ. Which, given how women were treated back in the day, is kind of strange because I, it just feels like women who are clearly not guilty were punished for stuff they didn't do, and women who are for sure guilty 
get off free. Her alibi was that she was in the barn when it happened, and then she walked to the house and what? Mom and Dad, what? what's going on here? Let me just wash off my bloody my bloody shorts here. What? Whoa, who did that? What? That's crazy. Number three, Mary Ann Cotton. Marriage can be tough, sure, but Mary Ann Cotton is the reason today you can't collect on life insurance when your spouse mysteriously, get your finger quotes out, mysteriously passes away. It all started when she predicted the passing of her stepson, and then it happened. That's weird. After that, it was her husband here, and then another husband there, and well, it's starting to get a little fishy, don't you think? Well, once these unexpected passings were looked into, they all had something in common, something in their tummies. Arsenic. Yes, she was getting rid of her husbands and then trying to claim the insurance money. Evil, but ahead of her time, like 50 years ahead of her time. That's that's insurance fraud. That's interesting. And well, it's also it's also like cold-blooded, cl calculated, unaliving, you know. But but insurance fraud too. <laughs> Number two, Tilly Kilmick. Okay, how about a literal psychic who knew when all of our late husbands were going to pass? In the late Victorian era, Tilly Kilmick was first found predicting the passing of scruffy wild dogs in the ghettos of Chicago. It's kind of a weird thing to say, like, mm, yeah, see that dog? The dog's not gonna make it. The dog? No, he's not gonna make it. Anyway, <laughs> somehow she always knew when they were going to expire. Then it was her late husband of 29 years. That's kind of strange, 29 years, and he ends up, hmm, that's weird. After cashing the insurance money, which she got immediately, she started dating immediately, where oblivious man after man kept passing, and very shortly after she married more and more. Well, she was a regular Marianne Cotton, to say the least, as she too was using arsenic on her husband to collect insurance money. She eventually was arrested, and her stipulation for being in prison was that she was not allowed to cook for anyone. I think that's fair. That's good. Don't let her cook. Don't, that's a good idea. Number one, ladies of the evening. Love them, hate them, or spend a lot of money on them in Vegas. That's, that's, that's Las Vegas, baby. The era was defined by them, especially in London. Ooh, baby. I mean, at night, you really couldn't walk anywhere without a fair lass daintily waving her hand in hopes of luring in a customer, which wasn't really an issue given that bedroom-related sicknesses were at an all-time high. Syphilis specifically had shockingly high percentage of the population and would make you think twice. Well, it would make us think twice, it would make me think twice, but people back then, uh, they kind of just went for it. Raw, is something wrong with you, love? I don't care, let's go anyway. Number 10, train engine cleaner. Ever wanted to get inside a small hole in the engine of a train and shovel out the coal that was left in there? Ever wanted to go underneath a train where you can't fully stand up in the middle of the night and rake out a dusty ash pan, getting all kinds of ash and stuff in your mouth? Perfect! You can go join up with the railroad as a train engine cleaner. These guys would spend their days shoveling five to six tons of coal into the furnace of the steam trains, and then spend their nights climbing into said furnace, cleaning it out, and then going out in the middle of the freezing cold, wet night into a trench covered in water and oil and dust, and get right up under that sucker and pull out all the ashes and dust and crap that came out of the engine while it had been running all day. Number 9. Linker Boy or Linker Men Before the introduction of gas lights on the streets of London, the only gas lighting came in the form of small children who made you believe that you wouldn't be able to walk the streets without them tagging along with a torch to help guide your way. Then they'd expect a tip from you. Oh, rascals. They weren't so bad. They were generally pretty helpful in getting you from point A to point B while being able to see one foot in front of the other. And their charge was usually just one farthing, or the equivalent of a quarter. The linker boy, like a lot of the jobs on this list, was actually featured in a lot of art and literature from the time, and there were even some rather infamous ones, like Lawrence Casey, who was the personal linker boy for the courtesan Betty Careless. Oi! Where you going, mate? You forgot to like and subscribe to the channel. Oh, and while I've got your attention, why not take a little peek over at our Facebook, where you'll find behind the scenes content. Get on with it! All right, all right, bloody hell, bloody hell. Number eight, knock her up. No, not like that. God. Look. I despise my alarm clock. It wakes me out of my deeply deserved beauty sleep at 6 a.m. every weekday morning. Now take the alarm clock and assign that job to a real person. That person is a knocker up, a person employed to wake up workers at mills and factories on early shifts, going from house to house using a long pole to knock on bedroom windows. In other words, a person employed to become the epitome of all my hatred in this world. If you had this job, 
well, you're not alive anymore, but I hate you. The people at the time were somewhat friendlier than they are now, and I'm sure the knocker-upper wasn't a horrible person, but I'm sure there had to be some grumpy gills who would put their hand on your chest for doing this to them. Number seven, a phrenologist. I think if this YouTube thing doesn't work out for me, I'm gonna go and make up a science. It worked for phrenologists. They claimed that a person's personality, character traits, and abilities could all be figured out by bumps and indents on a person's skull. Characteristics like secretiveness, amativeness, conjugality, and combativeness were apparently controlled by areas of the brain that they called organs of the brain. The idea was dismissed by the church, but it nonetheless gained traction through Europe and was really popular in the States. The idea that you could modify these organs through self-control and practice sounded really good to self-help gurus at the time, if only it was real. Number six, a dog whipper. Looking for someone who absolutely despises dogs and doesn't mind being despised by the rest of us otherwise known as a dog whipper. Back in the day, huntsmen would often hunt foxes and nail their tails to church doors, which would attract dogs of the streets. You'd also have churchgoers who would bring their dogs with them to church. These dogs were not allowed in though, so they'd all have to wait outside. You know how dogs are though. They didn't just sit there waiting patiently. I'm sure some good boys and girls did, but more often than not, they'd be playing and sometimes fighting, disrupting the church services. Enter the dog whipper, who was armed with tongs to grab a dog and remove it from the church grounds, and a whip that would be used on the loudest of the poor pooches. Number five. A rat catcher. I know this will make a few of you out there squirm in your seats. Rats in Victorian England were a massive problem. They were everywhere. Every nook and cranny of your house, from the basement to the pipes. There was even an account of them spilling over from royal parks. So of course, where there is a problem, there is a job. Rat catchers were pretty famous throughout the Victorian era and were highly praised in society, but the job wasn't too glamorous. You'd be going into the dark, dirty places where rats would make their homes and catching and often killing thousands of rats a year. Often rat catchers would use other animals like dogs and ferrets to help them hunt down the rats too. I don't know though, it's gonna be me. Number four, an upright worker. Upright workers, otherwise known as chimney sweeps, actually started off being children as young as the age of four. The smaller size of the little kiddos was perfect for fitting inside and climbing up and down chimneys. The little suckers would rub their elbows and knees up against the brick of the chimney so much that they would be scraped raw before callousing. Isn't that lovely? No, no it's not. It's horrible. Some children were deliberately underfed to keep them small enough to do the job. Some of them would get permanent lung damage from the dust and smut and smoke from the chimney. Some kids even got stuck in the chimneys. Thank the Lord they eventually passed a law that would make it illegal for anyone under the age of 21 to be a chimney sweep. But even then, tis not a profession many would like to have. Number three, matchstick makers. The idea of a lighter wasn't really a big thing in the Victorian era. They definitely existed, as the first one was invented in 1823, but it was not exactly a portable thing. So matches were your match. The first match was invented in 1805, but it sucked. The first friction activated match came about in 1826, and they were made with white phosphorus, which is extremely toxic. But they didn't have machines to make these matches. No, it was actually mainly done by teenage girls and in the worst of conditions too. Forget protective gear. Oh, you wanna take your lunch break away from the highly toxic white phosphorus? Oh, no, no, no. That's right, these girls would have to eat their lunch at their workstations, meaning they would end up ingesting the white phosphorus. Mmm, yes, my favorite seasoning. Number two. Resurrectionists. Back in the day, medical schools who wished to study the human body only really had access to the bodies of criminals who had hit the end of the line. There actually weren't too many of these bodies around, which led to a good price for bodies that were in reasonably good condition, other than being deceased. This wasn't exactly the greatest idea, as now you've created an opportunity for people with no morals or empathy to go and dig up fresh graves, becoming resurrectionists. A cool name for an absolutely god-awful profession, if you could call it that. The problem was bad enough that people would actually guard the graves of their recently deceased loved ones. No one should have to do that. Number one, Night Soil Man. All right, if you need me, I'll be depositing my night soil over in the toilet. Poop. Night soil is poop. And the Night Soil Man? Well, you see, 
Before we had real sewer systems, the night soil you deposited at home would go into a lovely hole in the ground. As you can imagine, these would tend to fill up over time, and that's when you have your night soilman come in. Yes, his job was to clear out the poop deposits from houses and cart it away in the middle of the night so nobody in polite society would have to see it. But they were always in business, so that makes the job a little less crappy. Let's start off with a title that describes the Victorians in of itself, melodrama. The Victorian era culture wasn't actually the whole fair ye black death blah blah vibe entirely. It was more like the Robert Downey Jr. Sherlock Holmes movies where it's dark and gritty and the people are obsessed with death and corruption of religion and occult stuff. The word melodrama, literally meaning music drama or song drama, derives from Greek but reached the Victorian theatre by way of the French who had adopted the interest during the revolutionary period. In Britain, melodrama became the most popular kind of theatrical entertainment for most of the 18th and 19th century, a period where more people went out to the theatre than any other time in history. Melodrama's unprecedented popularity during the Victorian period owes its life to the diverse audience it could draw, working class to aristocratic, but it also the illegitimate theatres that had been forbidden by law to perform drama involving spoken word. Many melodramas were book renditions or artisanal written and often featuring gore or death, and remained popular until the end of the 19th century. Looking for a less noisy affair, more somewhere to chat, but also be entertained, why how about the music halls? Even more popular for their variety of singing, contortionists, illusionists, animal tamers, trick cyclists, ballet girls, and more! These emerged in the 1850s, and by the 1870s there were hundreds across Britain. The audiences chatted throughout the acts, and they could be unruly, throwing things at performers like bottles, old boots, vegetables, and even dead cats. In some halls, bottles carried by weight were chained to the trays, and the orchestra was protected from flying objects by steel grills. While women initially weren't allowed in the middle class song and supper rooms, they were later encouraged to attend because people hoped that they would have a civilizing influence on the men. Who, who thought that? That's not why women wanted to go. Anywho, throughout the 1860s it became more common for women to perform in music halls themselves. Many married into aristocracy because of it, got hired onto big performers and went touring, or ended up modeling for magazines. Through topical songs, music halls played the political edge and kept their audiences informed and educated about their rights and about the current social, economic, and political issues or corruptions. The last two decades of the 19th century saw steady efforts to control and regulate music halls, with music regulation, performer regulation, enforcement measures to reduce alcohol in worker and girls, and slowly introducing higher paying audience. And since I mentioned alcohol, the Victorian era was one of mixology. Many of the cocktails we drink now we owe to the British advent, and mixology has Historians consider the time of the mid 1800s to prohibition to be the golden age of mixology. Cocktail bars today use recipes and techniques that derive or replicate what the Victorians used in mix. The term cocktail began to be used in the very late 1700s, with the first workable definition printed in 1806. The popular mixed drinks of the time were punches and warm spice drinks served in large quantities rather than individually prepared drinks. Industrialization and changing societal norms came the rise of the cocktail because more available ingredients, the availability of ice, and the societal change seeing men and women working class aristocratics socializing together in public. So emerged career bartenders. One of the first people to make a name for himself was the hotshot bartender Jerry Thomas. He's so responsible for creating the trend he's considered the father of American mixology. In fact, there was a gin craze of the 18th century and it highlights the Brits love of cocktails. The consumption of gin in Great Britain, especially London, was so high Parliament passed five major acts in 1729, 36. 43, 47, and 51 designed to control the consumption of gin. Whether at home, the music halls, or the dirty smoggy streets, the Brits loved a good novel. Print culture in Victorian era was diverse, aided by relatively high literacy rates. There were hundreds of magazines and newspapers available at cheaper prices, so even the most lowly and humble could enjoy some writing, even if it was subpar entry level crap. The 1880s saw the emergence of the new journalism, which drew in readers with pieces of violent crimes and scandals in high society. A AKA the true crime podcast of the times. Then novels were a key feature of the Victorian print culture. By mid-century, Britons of all classes could afford and read novels. Some were aimed at the highly educated and well-off people, others at less educated readers looking for appealing and exciting stories. Penny dreadfuls and sensation novels seen at their best in the work of Wilkie Collins thrilled their readers. And Victorian novels were often long with complicated plots and many characters. Many of those by Charles Dickens are still read today, and the Penny dreadfuls 
just made it to the TV screen in the masterful three season TV drama. You guys should check it out. And where better to read my newest Mary Shelley horror than my bestest painted office filled with taxidermy. The Georgian era was one of rationalism, but a shift in ideology took place as this period transitioned into the Victorians. Their view aligned more so with the romantics who were intrigued with by mysticism and death. So while they were a time of technological advancement and progress, culturally Victorians were prone to bizarre habits and beliefs. Like when a human family member passed away, Victorians did an extensive mourning ceremony. Like take pictures with the dead, sometimes wear black for years, sob and roll on the ground. So when a family pet passed away, it's not that much different and it's common to hire a taxidermist to preserve the animal, giving them a second life, which reflects the Victorian belief that animals should be useful to humans even in death. Walter Potter was a celebrated celebrity English taxidermist, known for his dioramas of animals mimicking real life situations. Also famously known for not being an who killed his animals to create art, but rather receiving donations from local farmers to do so. In 1861, Potter opened his own museum to showcase his creations, and it remained popular until the early 19th century when people began raising questions about how ethical taxidermy was. Victorians actually liked to collect weird stuff so much they made curiosity cabinets. Victorians were curious people with an interest in nature, the sciences, anatomy, botany, and morbidity. And for the upper class citizens, collecting scientific objects showed they were sophisticated and educated educated, often displaying their collections in a curiosity cabinet. These German cabinets were a way for the wealthy to show off their hobby. Oftentimes, beautiful wooden display cases with elaborate carvings and glass fronts, or a larger, narrow, open shelving style bookcase. Curiosity cabinets were usually kept in places where guests could see them to stir conversations about the pieces. And collecting was a social activity that allowed you to share your interests and also show off what you knew in a humble manner. Many curiosity cabinets were eclectic, filled to the brim with unrelated mixed oddities. Although most collectors were not formally trained, this never deterred anyone and even working class people started collecting items like buttons, fetishes, pocket sized portraits, stones and animal bones. Death, insect and human oddity photographs were as popular as Pokemon. Even oddity performers made business cards called carte de viste, a small photograph card collectible of themselves. Joseph Merrick, a professional showman known as the Elephant Man, was a popular carte de viste. And he worked for the next topic on the list the freak shows. It was a weirdly massive part of the Victorian culture, described as a family friendly commercial event. They were the entertainment pinnacle. The name itself is offensive and many Victorians even then boycotted the shows for its mockery and ableism. But the shows acted as a source of solace for performers that were often disabled or had genetic differences that made them potentially rejectable from society and potentially their own families. In the Victorian era, asylums were hellish and if that was your option or a job in the circus, many made the choice to live in a welcoming community of similarly ostracized people with differences. Siamese twins, extra limbs, excessive hair growth, malformation, and many married and had children and functioning lives of normalcy despite making a living performing for audiences as freaks. Their stories embody the magnificent resiliency of human spirit and they make a killing off the lustuous need for weirdness in the Victorian era, emptying wallets of people who wouldn't accept them outside of a show ring and living more financially secure than they did. The show started in the 1500s but hit their boom in the 1800s, and the best performers were often found in Queen Victoria's own court. Some famous names were Millie and Christine McCoy, John Merrick, Fanny Mills, Prince Rondian, and Ella Harper. Next up is how Victorian oddity obsession literally irreparably destroyed a ton of history. Egyptomania. It began in 1798 with the launch of Napoleon's campaigns in Egypt and Syria, a fitting example of imperialism when they find the Rosetta Stone. Europe goes on a mission to proliferate and appropriate any and all Egyptian antiquity or aesthetic culture vulture style. The Egyptian obsession consumed Western thought, revealing itself through their literature, art, and culture at the time. This included their mummy unwrapping parties and novels such as Arthur Conan Doyle's Lot 249, and also their decor. Anyone who could afford to travel to Egypt could realistically afford to buy a mummy because they kind of sold them at bazaars like Barbies at Walmart. When it came to mummy unwrapping parties, Victorians let their intrigue cloud their, let's see, judgment, human decency, morals, conscious, man, am I missing anything? It was a form of entertainment that was a complete desecration of Egypt, its people, and their ancestors. Thomas Pettigrew, who was a surgeon, antiquary, and an author, was a well-known unroller at one notable gathering for the unwrapping of Neshkins. The second wife of Thebian high priest Pio Jem II was placed in a contraption that made her appear to dance. The demand for mummies to take home was so high that Egyptians even started transporting them from less visited ruins to areas that got more traffic. Hundreds are now lost 
as are their tomb locations. These gatherings thankfully died out in the later years of the 19th century, not because Victorians realized their inhumanity, but because of boredom. Because the Victorians were greedy, nothing filled their interest for very long, except occult and spiritualism. They put that bleep in everything. Books, newspapers, clothes, art, decor, parties. The modern spiritualism movement was generally agreed to start on April 1st of 1848 in Hydesville, New York, when teen sisters claimed to speak to a ghost of a man killed in their home. News that spread worldwide and that had a complete fascination chokehold on England, causing the spiritualism movement of the 1860s and attracting people from different social classes, including Queen Victoria. The most popular forms of occult interest in the late Victorian period include mesmerism, clairvoyance, electrobiology, crystal gazing, specialty newspapers, public seances, thought reading, and above all else, conjuring. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, like many late Victorians, was fascinated by the possibility of communication with the departed souls. The core belief of their spiritualism movement was that the living could communicate with the dead through the help of a medium endowed with the supernatural gift during the mysterious and entertaining seance phenomena or performance. Charlatans will always take advantage after all. Within the late Victorian counterculture of spiritualism, a number of women and men gained fame and authority as skilled mediums. And now for the original garden gnome, the dirty old man in the backyard. See this? This is a gnome. If you're a basic B word, you might consider just tossing one of these among your flowers and calling it a day. No, you want this. See this? This is the dirty old dude that you would hire to live menacingly in your backyard. Why? I don't I don't know. Why not? I I don't have an answer for you. So yeah, uh, in the Victorian era, 18th century, wealthy families hired people to don full hermit garb, complete with robes, long hair, beards, and as Campbell cites from an advertisement in 1797, Herman is never to leave of the place or hold a conversation with anyone for seven years during which he's neither to wash himself or cleanse himself in any way whatever, but is to let his hair and nails on both hands and feet grow as long as nature will permit them. These hired hermits would then lodge in shacks, caves, and other hermitages constructed on the homeowner's property, a rustic fairy tale manor or a creepy, I don't really know. It was a practice mostly found in England, although it made it up to Scotland and over to Ireland as well. But it originates in Rome. Emperor Hadrian had one of these at his villa in Tivoli as a thinking lodge, as did Pope Pius III. From there, it gradually verged away from religious devotees seeking isolation for themselves for spiritual reflection to a stinky dude lodging for an 18th century profession. It might seem like a whimsical garden feature, but it was all about that most celebrated Georgian England emotion, melancholy. Introspection and somberness of spirit were prized amongst the elite, and rules that they asked the hermits to play embodied this because they weren't able to do it themselves. The ornamental hermit vanished at the end of the 18th century to be replaced by these ugly little monstrosities. So go stomp on a gnome today, everyone. Number 10. No calling, no gifts. This is a time in history when men were told to be gentlemen and women told to be ladies. Naturally, that came with some weird social practices. For instance, women were discouraged from accepting gifts from men. Personally, I like to give my girlfriend flowers and chocolate. I'm a classic guy, what can I say? Can't go wrong with that. However, even if a handsome silver tongued devil such as myself were to give some flowers and the finest dark chocolate a 7 Eleven has to offer, and a most promising woman were to accept said gifts, she may not be able to call me back. Literally, because well, the phone isn't exactly a thing yet, and also because that's something else women were just discouraged from doing. Pfft. Call on a man? No way, Jose! Even if he is super nice and waiting for a genuine response. One etiquette guidebook from 1882 called any woman who calls on a man ill-bred and positively improper to do so. I like when people give me flowers and chocolate. Maybe call me sometimes, I'm a little lonely. Number 9. Act like a lady. How dare ladies do anything unladylike? Ugh, said every man ever in the Victorian era. This is a time in history when ladies gotta be ladylike. That means makeup, corsets, and, and don't you dare do anything masculine. Oh, that's me angry. This is still a time when food isn't the greatest either, so imagine if you got an upset tummy at the dinner table. Happens to me a lot. You've got a handsome prince that your parents have arranged for you to marry. When you go to greet him, you do it with a simple gesture as kneeling to curtsy could turn your linens a certain shade of embarrassment that 1800 stain cleaning technology could never wash away. You'd poop yourself. Where's Billy Mays when you need him, right? 
How dare woman do such things as go number two, or even worse, break wind? Oh, the nerve. That's just the way it went, folks. I don't make the rules. Number eight, charged with love. Naturally, this was the past, and not being open to homosexuality was just the way it was, especially when tucking yourself into bed at night alone wasn't allowed either. Homosexuality just wasn't gonna happen. They, they just weren't gonna be approved of it. It's just how it goes. It sucks. However, it's almost as if there's been love on this earth since day one, and to stop that kind of love, it's just silly, man. Wherever I go, everyone is welcome on this channel or my Twitch. Chetty loves everyone because in reality, this is a time period where you could wind up in jail for that kind of love. And as Awesome Powers would say, that's just not very groovy, baby. Yeah. Strangely enough, homosexual relationships between women might have been completely overlooked as they were sometimes mistaken for women being friends. Yeah, I know. Some women even lived together, but given that they probably needed each other for financial support, people just kind of thought that's how it went and they ignored it. It's like they live together and you start putting the pieces together and it's like, you know, they I don't know, something weird going on there. But love everybody, come on, be nice. Number seven, a good thing. If I'm talking about medieval times, there's a good chance I'm gonna bring up the super not cool, not fun, do not condone or support the behavior of marrying a woman at the age of 12. Yucky. In part one, I mentioned that there was a ton of corners and streets being worked by the only other job besides street cleaners at 3 a.m. by women. However, after venereal disease was becoming a serious issue, it was getting pretty bad. It was becoming clear that a lot of people who were getting sick were young women, like 11 to 16 age group. Oof. Which I shouldn't have to tell you is bad. That, that's pretty bad, dude. When I was 16, I was rocking Black Ops 2, hanging out with my buddies, and partying hard in the summer. I got a lot of good stories. Maybe I'll share them one day. Catching all that nasty stuff is no way to spend your youth. So thank God the government changed the age of consent to 16 years old, which I know is not a solution for everything that was going on, but it was a small step forward in the right direction. That's what we like. Good history moving forward. We like that. Chetty likes. Number six, the seam seamstress. Being that the industrial revolution had started and business was booming, people needed to travel for business. Or more specifically, men needed to travel for business. Which means they gotta be away from their wives, and that means they are away from the very thing we're talking about today. Bedroom stuff. How did men solve this issue? Well, there was no shortage of ladies roaming street corners to uh, aid in, in that matter. However, there's an option with a little less syphilis. There were AIDS or early blow-up dolls called travel ladies. Strangely enough, it was stored in a gentleman's hat. What? That's so wrong. Once it was ready to be used, it was inflated and reassembled. This is a quote from an ad from one of the products. It is inflated to the essential part of the woman wanted by a man. That just, that just doesn't sound very good. This is why we have boards of people to check stuff from products before it gets shipped out to the public. I feel like that just wouldn't fly very well today. Number five. Big polluter. This just doesn't make any sense. It never did to me, and it still doesn't. But in case you didn't know, self-pleasure was a big no-no, commonly called self-pollution, which honestly is very funny to me. That's just hilarious. Don't self-pollute yourself, Chris. That's bad. Don't do that. That's naughty. It was a sin and thought to be a cause for many ailments. I'm sure you've heard the classic saying that for guys, if you decided to go bump in the night by yourself, there's a good chance you'd need a walking stick because it would make you go blind. Women were also targeted, however, as for any pearl polishing by women was thought to be hysteric and needed to be treated for such. Look, the truth is, any man who wants to wax his carrot or woman tuning a one dial radio should be able to do so without judgment of society or medical remedies of snake oil doctors. Love yourself, love everybody else, and just, as long as the bedroom door's closed, you're good. Just, just don't do it in public, you're good. Number four, shake and bake. I'm something of a scientist myself, but that doesn't mean I know everything, and if you actually need to learn something about health and safety, take it from a professional, not a second-rate John Candy. However, when coming across this fact, I just had to share it, because with my medical knowledge, this just doesn't sound right. All right, so kids, we know how they're made. I don't need to go into detail for that. However, there was this idea back in the Victorian days that if a woman danced shortly after doing what mommy and daddies do, then there was a chance that her pregnancy just wouldn't happen. Or perhaps more commonly after riding a horse, S same idea, uh, okay. Which is frankly 
horse. I mean, come on, my mom always told me when she was baking that I had to be quiet and stop running around the house or the cake she was baking wouldn't rise. Well, they always did, and I love chocolate cake. I mean, really, I do. I'm starting to wonder if there's a connection here. I was a rowdy kid. Number three, the Kensington system. Poor Queen Victoria. I know this is kind of a stretch, but it relates back to the whole mistreating women thing. But basically, it was something implemented in order to control the young royal, make her dependent on her mother, whom she was not allowed to be without. Basically, modern day strict parents. Now, all the kids watching right now, or all the kids who've grown up, how well did that parenting work? Let us know in the comments. I'm willing to bet it created a little bit of a divide between parent and child, am I right? That's exactly what happened with Queen Victoria. Shouldn't be surprised, really. Being a parent is tough. I get that. But squeeze too hard and the sand falls through the cracks of your hand. Victoria wasn't even allowed an hour to herself. And I don't care who you are, no matter how charismatic or bubbly, everybody needs some alone time. Number two, a healthy breakfast. Okay, not Victorian London, but this is just too funny not to mention, and it's around the same time period, very close. As the great minds of the time thought, self-pollution was a big no-no, and the reason for these urges was often related to food. Some thought eating meat would make you down bad, so a man named John Harvey Kellogg, you might have heard of him, aimed to cure the sickness of self-love. What if a man had a delicious, nutritious meal to eat, especially at the start of his day? Cornflakes! by Kellogg's, the, the very same cereal that's probably sitting on top of your fridge, yeah, was partially originally designed to stop you from feeling those carnal urges. Now, not sure if that works. I mean, go ahead and tell me how you feel after eating a bowl of that. I had one this morning. I feel fine. I don't feel any different at all. I mean, I'm just, well, I'm not really feeling the same about Pam Anderson anymore, though. Number one, rising action. This could get some married couples into some trouble if they're watching. So sorry. It's gonna be hard to talk about this without saying it because YouTube will send a stern letter if I do, but here it goes. The deed was not considered done unless both parties had signed off on it, uh, had their toes curled. Reaching the peak, your magnum opus, the way I feel when I eat at McDonald's, DEFCON 1, or simply mispronouncing organisms in health class. I feel like once you're involved, you're involved. And to me, that's a done deal. You can't really reverse it from that point on, regardless of any of my euphemisms, but that's what they thought. They thought if you didn't, you both didn't climb that mountain together, it didn't happen. Cause science. Number 10, Boy Jones. What's more intimate than a stalker? Am I right, ladies? If there's one thing women have loved throughout history, it's having every second of their privacy being watched by some creepy man, right? No, I can only imagine it's been worse since the dawn of smartphones and social media. I just, that must be horrible. Well, as it turns out, there were some real creep wads in the Victorian era too. The boy Jones was a stalker of Queen Victoria, who on multiple occasions snuck his way into Buckingham Palace, one time escaping with a pair of the Queen's underwear. What? Arrested multiple times, but still somehow found his way back to the palace. But what they should have done was swap the queen's underwear for a pair of mine after a shift in the garden center I used to work at. Oh yeah, nobody's coming for you after sniffing those bad boys. Oh! Number nine, graceful words. This was a time when ladies were supposed to be ladies, and that means manners are on the table and elbows are off. Dresses were worn to not show ankles, God forbid an ankle or wrist bust out. I think more importantly, however, or rather unusual that is, is that women were expected to talk a certain way. Good evening, Mr. Barrows. You must excuse my tardiness. There was a dreadful man screaming at me because my ankles were shown whilst mounting my carriage. Your what was showing love? Oh, you heard of it. I can't believe it. Excuse me. I must be someone else. I don't need to tell you guys how ridiculous that is. I say fly out the handle, ladies. Wear what you want, do what you want. Number eight, shots. Not the kind I like. Well, I don't know about you guys, but nothing ruins the mood for me and my lady like being fired upon. Yikes. I'd like to stay the night, kid, but the automatic gunfire coming from outside is starting to get to me. See? All gangster impressions aside, things must have been that way for poor Queen Victoria as she was shot in her carriage in 1840. A young man fired two shots at her carriage. More attacks would actually follow in the coming years. It's kind of hard to feel that certain kind of way after bullets go grazing past your pretty face. 
The worst thing that ever happened to my generation was making sure nobody was home when you were studying with your boyfriend. I was too busy playing Call of Duty, but at least I never got actually shot at. You know what I mean? That's just a good thing. Number seven, expectations. All right, this one goes out to all the married ladies in the audience. Hello, how are you? I'm doing great, thanks for asking. I'm curious as to why you got married and what your expectations were. Did you marry your high school sweetheart and live happily ever after? Maybe you had a shotgun wedding and after one night at the saloon. Maybe you just really wanted to find a nice man and settle down, start a family, be a mother. I think any of those options are great, so as long as you have options. In Victorian England, you were expected to do the latter. Women were expected to get married and have kids, and that's about it, really. My question is, why were angles and wrists an issue, but giving birth isn't? What I mean is it's kind of a compromising position to be in. All I'm asking is that the girls get treated fairly and given choices and be allowed to show some ankle. That doesn't make any sense. You can look at her business down there, but you can't show an ankle. That doesn't make any sense. I'm a magician. Number six, double standard. Divorce sucks. It's no fun. The person you once loved and cherished is now the villain in your story. I love McDonald's and I don't ever want them to be the villain in my story. I love you guys. Gotta get those Happy Meals. Divorce is something that isn't new. Honestly, it was probably invented the second after marriage was. In Victorian times, men had the right to divorce their wife if they had committed adultery. Women could not. Well, if you refer to my last part, you know that men were doing more than a little window shopping when it came to women. When men left town for business, they would have hired the services of a woman who patrol the streets at night. No, I'm not talking about Batwoman either. So men can divorce women if they dare to do what they did on a regular basis. Yeah, that's that's totally fair, not, yeah, that's good, equal, absolutely, yeah. Number five, emo girl. All the forever alone people, raise your hand. Let me hear you roar XD. I like to joke around a lot and say I'm a lawyer, a firefighter, and the cutest guy on the whole wide internet. But if there's one thing I know, it's people. I like people. I love them. I spend a lot of time with them, and after hearing this, I've come to the conclusion that this is where the emo girls come from. I figured it all out. It's down to a science. I'm a scientist now. Do you ever get that feeling in your tummy on Valentine's Day because you know it's going to be another one alone? And you'll be forced to be on your own, and, and, and that means sad music and crying in your room. Same, it's, it's Drake's Marvin room for me. Well, single women in Victorian times had similar issues. Since women were expected to marry and have kids, single women who were also forever alone were pitied by society, which I argue is just way worse. Who, who, no one wants to be pitied. Ugh. Number four, gold diggers. She take my money when I'm in need. As she drive Okay, anyway, back to the actual content. Well, not exactly. While today in a place like sunny California, you might see an older man with a woman who's half his age. Maybe he's driving a nice car or she's got on the very best and latest from Louis Vuitton. Stylish, yeah. Most of us think some thoughts about what we might think is going on there. We can kind of be judgmental sometimes when we see things like that. However, looking through a lens of 2022 to Victorian times might make the women of Victorian times appear to be gold diggers, but in reality, it was because all of their financials were tied to their husbands, legally too. Which, if you can imagine, that system didn't work too well. What if your husband is broke? What if your husband is running amok with sultry lasses on the street corners? Like I said before, no divorce, but even if she could leave him easily, supporting herself afterwards was going to be an issue, especially financially. Number three, birth factory. Just pump them out. The faster the better. Quantity over quality, just, just get them out. The use of birth control, as you can tell, was not a common practice. Anyone who's over the age of 25, ask your grandparents how many brothers and sisters they have. I'm willing to bet it's in the six to eight range. Let me know in the comments below, I'm curious. A trend that would continue for a few decades after. Education is important, and I'll get to that in my next part. Women were simply expected to act this way. Maybe it was the sign of the times since the Industrial Revolution was in full swing. Maybe the factories needed workers, I don't know. Which, in case you didn't know, they used children as employees. Maybe not so nice. Unfortunately, that was when there was an issue, and there were many. They had no HR to go to, and that was the least of their worries, really. Number two, 
No school for you. No higher education for women. Banned from going to university. I don't think so, not very nice, no, no. Honestly, any society that doesn't want half of their population to go to school probably has a few things to work out. It's a boys club and they can only go to university so that they can learn to be smarter and be businessmen, so they can earn money and thus have the facilities to court a woman who really doesn't have a choice anyway. Women had jobs, not careers. And they were all the jobs that you can think of. The ones that were too feminine for men as women were too feeble to participate in a men's job, which is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. I'm happy to say that in 2022, we showed them wrong. Chetty loves everyone. Just remember that, I love everybody. You go, girls. Number one, strict rules. Okay, so after a night in the bed sheets with the gal that you love, or maybe the one that you found, there's a good chance that nine months later, a smaller version of you two could be walking around. A byproduct of intimacy, if you will. This was always something I wanted to rant about, but I always found it strange how strict parents and teachers from this time were with their kids. You gotta brush your hair, bed made, and whatever you do, don't ask for more gruel. Please sir, could I have some more? Whatever that Charles Dickens book was, I think it was Oliver Twist. They made us read those books as kids, and I don't know why, because they're kind of boring. From the extreme military code ethics happening at home to the long days in a factory at work, being a kid was tough, man. Earning the punk rock blues of today. I'm just a kid and my life is a nightmare. Number 10, it's just a cold sore. The Victorian era is cool. The art, the fashion, and technology technology of the time, I think, are always fun to take a look at, especially since steampunk has its roots in the Victorian era, and who doesn't like steampunk? Come on, there's just a lot of cool steampunk stuff, and honestly, we haven't seen a lot of that in a long time. We need, we need more. We need more. Something not so cool from that era, however, was what you could catch from another person should you decide to take up a bed with another person. Syphilis, yep, one heck of a disease. Funny enough, it was so common that it was making intimacy itself an unusual practice. People were scared, and honestly, maybe rightfully so. There's no cure, and if it progresses to its later stages back then, well, you'd go crazy. And then you'd end up being that guy that's always screaming in the streets. Every city has one. You know what I'm talking about. Number nine, the French letter. The issues of intimacy and its repercussions were becoming quite clear in the Victorian era. Something had to be done, as spending any amount of time in the brothels could have you shucking barnacles off your lower deck in the morning, if you know what I mean. Introducing the revolutionary new invention, prophylactics. For those that are college age, you might find it disturbing that these party favors weren't made of rubber or disposable. Yeah, hear me out. They were made of sheep's guts and they had to be soaked first so they would become flexible because when you put these bad boys on, they had to be fastened on. It's not very good, not very attractive. Once the deed had been signed off on, the device was then washed and then hung up to dry like your dirty laundry. Once it was dry, it was placed in a small box for the next time because seeing your wife's ankles might make you feel a certain kind of way and now you just have it ready to go. And Number eight, the products of our sins. Having fun when the lights can be turned off is great. Who doesn't enjoy a little toe curling, yeah? Except sometimes there's this crazy thing that can happen where after nine months, another human spawns in. Insane, right? I know. Well, back in the Victorian era, this phenomenon was happening, but only for married couples. As you have to be married, of course, or else a child would be born out of wedlock, which to people at the time was just the worst. Oh, I never. These stigmas were not favorable for women, as some preferred to avoid that kind of press by abandoning or straight up just unaliving their children. Horrible, just, just horrible times. Just another one of those good old wholesome times in history where we were treating women with the utmost respect and decency. Very nice. We were actually not very nice. Number seven, diet. Bedroom misconduct was becoming a huge issue. Refer to number nine and 10. While women did get most of the blame because, well, you know, history, men did get some of the blame. The issue of intimacy for men could be described as barbaric primal sense. So how do we curb this? How do we stop men from acting on these caveman urges, ooga booga? Well, simple, really. Men just have to stop eating certain foods, as it was thought at the time that food had a link to the misconduct, or rather, the overabundance of bedroom related issues, including mustard, pepper, rich gravy, beer, wine, cider, and tobacco. And if you weren't paying attention, that's basically the diet of every man in Victorian times. Not sure how a jar of finely prepped mustard would get you flustered, but okay, sure. The beer makes sense though, you know, have a few beers, and even the mop leaning over the corner looks pretty lonely and 
Boy, that mop has lovely hair. Number six, job market. Ladies of the evening, women of the night. Women who make beds go bump in the night. They were everywhere in Victorian London, a lot. It's partially related to some of the points I previously mentioned. Now, I'm not here to say it's necessarily a bad thing. Personally, I don't think it is. As they say, it's the oldest profession in the book, with an estimated 80,000 women working in the night by the late 1890s. You'd have to be crazy to miss that. I mean, they, they were literally everywhere. With numbers like that, there's something for everyone and in varying price ranges, as they can be found in brothels or townhomes set up by the wealthy men for their mistresses, pretty much anywhere trouble likes to spawn. Even some artists took advantage of this by living with the gorgeous girls of the evening, as going behind closed doors with one was debatable, but becoming friends? Now that's a social transgression. That, oh, becoming friend, oh, how dare you befriend the people of the night. Number five, Jolly Lad. When people think about certain magazines that depict lewd imagery, you probably only think of Playboy. The bunny imagery was good marketing, honestly, just, just smart. But what if I told you the Hefmeister wasn't the first to publish such a magazine or imagery? Back in the Victorian era, there was some saucy imagery being produced. The government had outlawed such indecency, but this only made the lewd picture industry move underground, where naturally it flourished, especially in major cities. And if you knew where to go and and how to ask for one, you could purchase something from the hidden menu. Kind of like when you go to McDonald's. Yeah, there's a hidden menu there too. Google it and see for yourself. I'd repeat what my favorite one is, but I would be in trouble from the YouTube gods. And I've been treading on thin ice this whole video, so. Uh, number four, the first counterculture. The 1960s were a very important time for many different people. Black Americans were fighting for the rights, music went from holding hands to strawberry fields, if you know what I'm saying, and everything that your parents told you just, just kind of felt wrong. If you grew up then, you know what I mean. I know people like to make fun of hippies, but there was some good ideas there. Well, in 1890s England, they were sort of having the same thing happen. Obviously, not as strong as a push as it was in the 60s, but still. Basically, after all the oppression towards bedroom relations, people began to open up. Uh, not literally, just, just open up thinking-wise. That's really gross, don't repeat that. There's only one way we all got here. Unless you're a test tube baby, of course. In that case, thank you for watching CT133576-2. To some historians, this makes sense. When you push and push for things to happen or ban, eventually people will push back, especially if it's something like bedroom time. Everybody, everybody likes a little bit of bedroom time. Valentine's Day wasn't too long ago. Remember that? It was good. It was fun. It was good, good fun. Number three, Jack the Ripper. While the man's numbers don't compare to any of the other horrible people in history, he's unusual because of his brutality and the fact that he was never caught. Jack the Ripper was maybe the first modern serial on a liver. He haunted the streets of Victorian London and is responsible for claiming multiple women's lives, women of the evening to be exact, and they began to know the name Jack the Ripper. Now, we'll probably just have to show you pictures of Victoria London or maybe some B-roll of a shadowy figure because there ain't no way we can show the crime scenes. There's probably a dozen different theories on who done it. Some say it was multiple men using his name as an alias. Some say it was Prince Albert. There's even some who suggest that he was a she, and which explains why women were so easy to go off with Jack. That actually kind of makes sense to me at least and why no one really would be looking for a woman back then. Kind of makes sense. Anyway, be careful out there, ladies. Just, just be careful. Number two, Queen Victoria. It seems old blighty herself may have been a tad more promiscuous than you'd think a royal to be. Well, not with other men, but her husband, who in her diary claims to be the love of her life, which honestly is kind of sweet and, and romantic. That's nice. One thing that I find interesting, however, is that while lewd images were outlawed, the queen may have commissioned a painting of herself that was quite risque for the time. To gift to her husband, of course. Like, hypocrisy much? I say lewd, but it was probably just in her loose fitting clothes with maybe like an ankle showing or something. Still, unusual behavior for the queen. I'll remember that the next time, Bly. I'll remember that. Number one, Prince Albert. If you've ever stepped foot into a tattoo parlor, then you might know where I'm going with this. Prince Albert, the husband of Queen Victoria, had some controversy circulating his name. One, because he shares a name with another Prince Albert, who was speculated to be Jack the Ripper, but also because of a very unique piercing. Go ahead and take a guess where that piercing is. Yeah, I didn't think so. As a man, if your anatomy could be described by an internet comedian using moderately funny euphemisms, then the piercing would go through your German army helmet. That makes sense, right? The horror, the absolute horror. It's rumored that he had one of these piercings. Did he? Ah, I'm not sure. But if it means anything to you, Nicholas II had a tattoo, so 
not completely out of the realm of possibility. Number 10, the hobble skirt. This is a bad idea written all over it. The hobble skirt, also jokingly called the speed limit skirt, was a dress with a very tight hand, making the poor lass who's wearing its movement, well, not having much of it. Can't have the wife running off from her home now, <laughs> even if that, you know, that meant the home was not a good place and men acted really bad back then. But no, you can't have her running away. Apparently though, some were so tight that it caused women to fall, and in some extreme cases, I, I can't believe this, those falls were fatal. What? Number nine, muslin dresses. Honestly, I can see celebrities doing this today. Okay, so the female figure. It's sleek, it's curvy, it's gorgeous. Today a girl's got some options on how she wants to flaunt what her mama gave her. You go, girls. But back then, well, not, not so much. Except for the muslin dress, apparently, which I find strange at the time, since seeing a woman's ankle could give a guy a stiff neck for hours, if you catch my drift. Essentially, this was a dress that you had to wet first, like a, a gentle misting, if you will. Yeah, weird, right? And then you'd wear it out. Now, for the summertime, this makes sense, and honestly, I might support this myself, actually. See the curves, stay cool. However, some stories tell us of women who wore this during cooler weather and then got sick. Fashion over function, ladies. Be careful. That's a silly one. Oh, 40 below, I better wear my muslin dress. Yes, I'm just gonna walk out. <laughs> Number eight, ladies wear. Okay, this is a general one, but ladies dresses and wear in general was just ridiculous. I mean, I mean those big poofy dresses, it just seems like ladies had it rough. When have they not? Wear a dress that's too tight or so big you struggle to walk around. Not to mention the fancies of dresses have wire, wood cages and frames. Just making walking around more difficult because yeah, that makes sense. For me, anytime I wear formal wear, I keep an eye out for bathrooms. You never know when you need to go. However, I just can't imagine trying to squeeze the lemon in those bad boys. Whew, that would be difficult. To make matters worse, there are stories of women wearing just regular big poopy dresses and then getting in accidents at factories. And yes, it was gruesome. And yes, they didn't make it out. And no, there's no movies about it, stop asking. Number seven, pestilence fabrics. Last time I was talking about the Victorian era, I mentioned a few points on fabrics with harmful and dangerous chemicals, which happened more than it should have. It shouldn't happen at all, really. It's kind of sad. Well, that wasn't the only fabric-related issue that was out to get you back then. For example, wealthy people couldn't be bothered to do their own laundry. I hate doing laundry, I don't blame you. I'm not wealthy, though. And sometimes would have them washed and taken away by launders who, well, wash clothes for the rest of the city. Being that clothes and washers themselves were poor, or that clothes were just mixed around regardless, well, that was an issue. There was a lot of sickness going around at the time, and, well, it was contagious. A lot of times, these sicknesses would cling to fabrics, and when given back to their customers, well, they could very well come down whatever London was feeling at the time. It doesn't sound like a lot of fun. I, I, I think I'll just wear more of my dirty stuff. I'll just wear my underwear for six months straight. It was white when I bought it, not anymore, but it's okay. Number six, lead. Here we go again. Lead, just lead in general. It was used in so much stuff. Seriously, it, it, it's scary. Especially because they knew it was harmful. It wasn't a secret, they knew. Uh, I was gonna pick one leaded item, but I, I mean, I couldn't. I mean, seriously, I know this is a list about fashion, but it was involved in some clothes making processes, it was, it was in women's makeup, which that's also fashion, and it was in house paint, which I know that's not technically fashion, but it kinda is. Trust me, I used to mix paint before I was an internet comedian. I know the history of paint. Ask me your paint-related questions in the comments below. I'm the guy you need to talk to. I mean, it was used in pipes, too, and we drank out of those. It's just crazy. Now, it is one of those things that minor exposure to is fine, sure, but the thing was with fashion and beauty is that you probably would use said product every day, like the clothing or the makeup, and especially the makeup of the ladies. Lead poisoning symptoms include headaches, stomach pain, constipation, infertility, and memory loss. Yikes, that's not fun. We don't like that here. Number five, corsets. Nobody wants a waist bigger than nine inches, said everybody in Victorian times. I, for one, can appreciate the female form and the hourglass figure. It's admirable, sure, but that being said, I, I don't think we need to go so far to keep the female form in shape. The corset's a little too much. 
Corsets were those chest tightening, gut sunking, push all to mince meat to the top of the pie apparel that went under every woman's dress or every fat dude in his 50s who wants to feel 29 again. I don't think I have to tell you why this is bad or uncomfortable. The human chest needs to breathe, and when something's that tight around you, well, you struggle to breathe. Uh, trouble breathing, fainting were not all too rare, especially in hot and humid climates. For my generation, you may recall Elizabeth Swan had issue with hers in Pirates of the Caribbean. And then she fell, and then Jack Sparrow caught her, and it was a good movie. But don't, the corsets, I just, I can't get behind them. Number four, foot binding. While not exclusively done in the Victorian era, it was started in ancient times and continued all the way up until the 20th century, thus includes the Victorian era. A Chinese fashion tradition that takes women's feet and binds them and squeezes them until they begin to change shape. Oh, poor ladies. Again, I don't think I need to tell you that forcibly changing bone and muscle structure in your feet just for fashion is a bad idea. I think you all know that. For starters, it doesn't look right. After years of binding, the shape of the foot drastically changes. Secondly, the health risk of doing such is not worth it. Oftentimes, toenails fall off or become infected. Ugh, gross. Bones break and pierce skin. It's a bad time all around. Thank God we stopped doing that, right? Jeez. Oh, well, thanks. Number three, lard wigs. Wigs have been around for a long time. If you're a fancy politician from Washington, you wear a powdered wig, singing Yankee Doodle Dandy all the way to the Capitol building. Balding men, women, or really anyone can wear a wig. It's, it's really for everyone. What I'm getting at is it's been around for a long time and we've come a long way. Given enough time and asked to tell the difference, I probably couldn't. I, I, really, I really couldn't point out a wig if, if you showed me. So we're getting really good at it these days. That being said, in the Victorian times, wigs were quite common and were fashioned with a peculiar substance. Lard, yes. Imagine every day of the week without proper baths or showers and living in close proximity to the Thames River. And you take a handful of pig lard and just slather that in your wig to style it. Put a gross sound effect in there, just gross sound, ugh. Do you imagine the smell? This is the most offensive hair crime since frosted tips in the early 2000s. Those were a big mistake too, I gotta say. Not, I had them, but it was, there's only one man who can pull that off. And he's in Flavortown, you know what I'm talking about. Number two, German helmets. 1914 was the end of the Victorian era and the beginning of the modern era. It's actually a very fascinating time. It's kind of like modern meeting the past, really cool. Well, fashion just doesn't mean civilian. Anyone who's ever spent time in the Marine Corps knows that they gotta look their best. Wah, Marines. The Empire of Germany was no different in 1914, and a lot of German soldiers wore helmets with an ornamental spike, like a Koopa from Super Mario. I know you guys have seen the movies, you, you, you've seen them. Except the main issue here wasn't an overweight Italian plumbers jumping on their heads, uh, but the war and the enemy itself. World War I was fought in a lot of trenches, so it's kind of awkward when you can see a bunch of little spikes moving up and around the enemy's trench. It's also kind of dangerous to have an extra piece on your helmet as you can get caught in weird places like barbed wire. And yes, if you're wondering, sometimes they were used in the absence of a good melee tool. Yeah, you'd be correct. Sometimes they did. You gotta do what you gotta do. Oh, brutal. Number one, French uniforms. More World War I, but it's still Victorian. It counts, I promise. While the spiked helmets were a very bad idea, they were shortly phased out. They learned their lesson. However, the French stood up and said, no, 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 I have a worse idea. Also, shout out to France. You guys get a bad rap for the war, but it's really your war. You guys rocked it, man. You guys are the best. Love France. Anyway, the French uniforms were a little bit of a mistake. In a classic case of fashion over function, kind of the theme of this list, they wore very bright and blue-red uniforms. Now, I don't know if you've noticed, but bright blue doesn't exactly blend into an environment. Thus, it made French soldiers a very easy target. Everything's like gray, black, and brown, and you're just wearing bright blue and red pants. Yeah, you're gonna, you're not gonna make it far, Chief. 